wind will just all rise. Well, because they are real judges in real life. So I think that would be show a great sign of respect to them and proper protocol. And then as soon as they make it through and they sit down, then we can sit down. And then the program can begin. Thank you so much. All rise in court.
You may be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Advocate H. Nkabinde, and I will be your program director for today. I would like to greet you all and greet the participants, and more importantly, greet our esteemed guests, our judges for today, who've sacrificed their time their work to be with us today to give us the real life court experience. Um, as a side note, I've appeared before two judges here in real court, and what you were grilled on during these past few days is nothing compared to what we've been grilled in real court. So you should look forward to this experience. Even as a spectator, look forward to this experience because it is very, very educational and you live with nothing but knowledge of how it works in the real in the real world how it works in real court um mine is not much for today mine is just to describe the items on the on the program so mine is the easiest job for the day the contestants have that hard job and the judges have the even harder job to pick as to who's the winner today so without further ado, I know that we are running behind schedule. So in an effort to catch up, um, I'm going to request that the speakers of the, uh, that are listed on the program, we minimize the times allocated to us so that we can try and endeavor to catch up with time, if that is possible. <coughs> um, first, of all, first and foremost, I'd like to call to the forefront um, the acting executive dean for the College of Law. Uh, I call him the OG himself, uh, the boss man, Professor Kole, uh, to come and give a message from the College of Law and the deanery. Prof, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Program Director Advocating Kabinde, for the opportunity to speak here this morning. But let me thank and acknowledge the Deputy Executive Dean, Professor Budeline Makonde, amongst us here today, the Professor Gandelfinger, our esteemed judges, um, the head of the Law Clinic, for actively facilitating this event, the director of the School of Law, and the, the members of the College of Law for supporting students tirelessly we are happy about that. Uh, and I have heard that this morning, uh, it, it will be Cape Town versus Rustenbeck. These are the regions that we have. And we are wishing you well. We are not expecting anything than a very healthy competition here this morning, sound competition, that will be a reflection of what we have learned over the years so that you should come here today and compete, not just to compete, but to be the best, to compete to become the best. We really appreciate that. And in, the, in, in line with the university trajectory, we are happy when we see that our students feel supported, our students are amenable to competitions, and they can go there and represent themselves, and, 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 and with the knowledge or with the impression that the sky is the limit. You go and compete, you, come, you become the best. So we appreciate that. From the university, we are saying we, we, we encourage teaching and learning. We encourage sharing of knowledge. We, en we encourage research. Key to what we do is research. There's nothing you can do without research. And that is why it is, it, it is, it is a standing alone KPA in the university, that should actually be fulfilled because it, it, it informs you of the new developments. It informs you about the past. Of course, it helps you to, to think forward. And that's what we are expecting here today. 
So we are, we are very much happy and I'm excited to be here today to be seeing this type of uh, engagement. Uh, unfortunately, at 9.45, I'll be stepping out because of other competing events in the university. The, the Deputy Executive Dean is here and I'm here, which means somewhere else where we should be representing the college, uh, nobody is there. But um, that is something else we'll actually attend to that. And we are very much happy and we support you and we are saying uh, Professor Gandelfinger continue to, facilitate, to, to participate actively here. I know from time to time you even do some seminars. We are appreciative of that. The university community is very much happy about that. From time to time when you, you, you appear here, when you conduct your seminars, uh, because they actually fe uh, a feature in the university uh, internet. So they, they, they get very excited about, mostly about the topics that you deal with and they want more. That is the message I'm carrying for you. <laughs> they want more. So, so I'm happy because we are always amenable, making sure that they can, they, they can benefit. More so our students at the end, they are able to benefit from these engagements, active engagements that we, we are promoting from time to time. Thank you so much. I'm saying let the best team win. Thank you so much. Thanks, Program Director. Sipo. Thank you. Um, thank you for the message, Prof. Um, we will then be moving to the second item. As you can see, if you have the program, we've just swapped them around. We'll then move to the next item, which is actually the welcome, not the opening, the welcome from um, the attorney, senior attorney at the UNISA Law Clinic, Ms. Zintle Ketani. Thank you, Program Director. Good morning. Good morning to the Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University of South Africa, Professor Puleng Lenkabule. Good morning to the Acting Executive Dean of the College of Law, Professor Olaozu John Gole. Good morning to the Acting Executive Deputy Dean of the College of Law, Professor Pudeli Nemagonde. Good morning to the director of the School of Law, Professor Angelo Dube. Good morning to the director of the School of Criminal Justice, Dr. Lebohang Morodi. Good morning to the head of the law clinic, Advocate Kahudi Morota. Good morning to the head of teaching and learning, Mr. Mpomatala. Good morning to the head of graduate studies, Professor Tukishi Manamela. Good morning to the Head of Quality Assurance, Professor Dorothy Farasani. Good morning to all the heads and chairs of departments in attendance this morning. Good morning to our esteemed judges and speakers on the programs here today with us. Good morning to the leaders of the various student bodies represented here today. Last but in no measure the least, greetings to the ladies and gentlemen before me those who are staff members, students, participants, the ushers, and our online viewership. Your attendance here today and participation are deeply appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, as introduced by my colleague and program director, my name is Zindle Ketani, and I'm an attorney at the UNISA Law Clinic. Today, mine is just to welcome you guys on behalf of Advocate Maruta. He does send his apologies for not being able to attend today. Distinguished judges, esteemed participants, faculty members, and honored guests, it is my privilege to extend a heartfelt welcome to the finals of this prestigious inter-regional moot court competition. 
Today we stand on the threshold of legal excellence where knowledge, skill, and advocacy converge in the pursuit of justice. And before we embark on this final leg of an arduous yet enriching journey, I would like for us to take a moment to applaud in acknowledgement the dedication and hard work that have brought us to this moment. <laughs> to the finalists, as you stand on the brink of the interregional moot court competition final finals, I want to extend my heartfelt welcome and encouragement to you. Your journey to this moment has been marked by dedication, perseverance, and an unwavering commitment to excellence. You have demonstrated exceptional legal acumen, eloquence, and poise throughout this competition, earning you your place among the finalists. Your hard work and preparation have not gone unnoticed, and you should take immense pride in how far you have come. To the judges, we welcome you and extend our deepest appreciation for your time, expertise, and discernment. We know that your wisdom will guide us through the intricacies of the law, ensuring that, the, ensuring that justice is served with fairness and integrity. We further extend a warm welcome to our esteemed guests and online supporters. Your presence adds luster to this occasion, underscoring the importance of legal education and advocacy in our society. As we engage in spirited debate and rigorous legal analysis, may we uphold the principles of professionalism, civility, and respect. Let us embrace the opportunity before us to showcase the finest qualities of legal scholarship and advocacy. Thank you for joining us in this celebration of legal excellence, and may the proceedings ahead be marked by intellectual rigor, collegiality, and a commitment to the pursuit of justice. Welcome to the finals of the 2023 Interregional Mood Code Competition. I thank you. Thank you, thank you. Right. Moving swiftly along, I think you got the gist of that. Um, in essence, just do your best. You, do, you belong where you are right now. You belong here. You did, you overcome all the challenges, you fought all the other teams. So for you to be finalists is a big thing. You belong here, do your best today. I could not put it any better. And um, we'll move on to um, the project leader of the Moot Court, Ms. Nyambuza, to come and give us an objective as of the Moot Court competition as to why we host the moot court and why, what is the objective of it? Ms. Nyambuza? I think in organizing, she may also have stepped outside, um, but that's fine. She's, she's, she's around. Then what we can do is that just move on to the next item. So just we can, in the interest of time, we'll just flip back to her. We can then move on to the reading of the hypothetical case. Uh, we're gonna ask Mr. Ntlazi, Ntlazi to come and read us the hypothetical case. Mr. Ntlazi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As introduced, my name is Sigalela Ntlazi. And mine this morning is to read the hypotheticals so that everyone in attendance um, has an understanding of, of, of the facts, the issues, and just the overall general feel of the case. So without any further ado, this is a matter in the Constitutional Court of South Africa with case number 001 of 2023. This matter is between Temba Maluleke is the first applicant. He is accompanied by Rosalind Digo, Buti Poswa, Gugum Tembu, Shikli Nimsenge Community, Shikli Nimsenge Traditional Healers Group, and the African Community Council. The respondents in this case are the President of the Republic of South Africa, the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, 
Minister of Human Settlements, Department of Human Settlements, the Bogang Municipality, and Iron Africa Mining Corporate, as well as the Bogang Municipality and Forceful Removers. The facts are as follows. This case brought before the Constitutional Court is a striking attempt to achieve an equitable balance between the two competing scales operating in a democratic and capitalist nation. The first of these scales is the economic imperative and desirable achievement of resuscitating an ailing economy or perhaps economic growth in South Africa through the operation of the country's mining sector. The second considerable scale is the preservation and protection of the most central tenets of human rights, particularly those of vulnerable segments and of our society. The delicate balancing of these two has, has to be executed in the most conscious and informed manners. Undoubtedly, if this is not properly executed, the adverse consequences therefore will ricochet into related ramifications in other sectors of society, thus impeding the quest for transformative constitutionalism and substantive democracy. The first chapter of the facts. South Africa boasts an internationally competitive mining economy and the exporting of domestically mined minerals is responsible for an 8% contribution to the gross domestic product. Some of the economically valuable minerals mined throughout South Africa include gold, diamonds, coal, copper, manganese, and iron ore. As recent as 2010, there has been a burgeoning international demand for iron ore, and this has boosted South Africa's global mineral exports. Along with this, International need, however, the demand for iron ore mining has also increased domestically. The mining of iron ore has become a specialist niche area of one mining company, namely Iron Africa Mining Corporate, IMC for short. This particular firm has led more iron ore mining operations in the last decade than any other mining corporation in South Africa. IAMC is headed by its CEO, Andre Tom, and he reports to his board of directors biannually. The IAMC board sets broad company policies and makes important decisions as a fiduciary on behalf of the company and its stakeholders, or perhaps shareholders, pardon me. Specific issues that fall under the IAMC's broad purview include mergers and acquisitions, dividends and major investments, the design of new mining operations, as well as the hiring and firing of senior executives and their compensation. At the last board meeting, new strategic matters were tabled and most, of, and most relevant was the strategic operative goal to meet the high demand for iron ore. The goals were set and the mandate was therefore issued to the operations department to undertake new prospecting and mining activities. This led IAMC to conduct prospecting operations in the region of Bogang in the Eastern Cape. The legislative and policy requirements for obtaining the prospective rights were satisfactorily complied with through the prospecting phase, IMC found a desirable volume of iron ore reserves which attracted the financial department. This is the catalyst for the legal department initiating formal processes to apply for a mining permit. The legislative requirements for the application and granting of a mining right were all complied with, and as such, IAMC was granted a mining right. However, for nine years, the mining operations in the Mogang region were postponed due to a contractual dispute between IAMC and its equipment provider. During this, during this time, people now known as the Shiklinim Singer community moved and settled into the land in pursuit of sustenance in the form of fertile soil to farm, pastures for their livestock, as well as other various water resources. Or perhaps water sources, pardon me. Iron ore is found in almost all the Bogang region, but the most voluminous reserves are located in and around the east of the region, the Shikli Nimsenge area. The entire Shikli Nimsenge community, as well as other villages, as well as other village communities, are headed by a village council of community elders, headed by the traditional leader of the region. This council is called the African Community Council, ACC for short. The rules and regulations governing the conduct of the ACC are prescribed by Traditional Council Management Board of South Africa. The ACC also conducts its affairs in accordance with the constitution it has adopted. The constitution which governs the land dictates that for any decision taken by the ACC to be valid, it should be decided and agreed upon by the traditional leader plus two council members or four council members 
One of the express provisions of the ACC's constitution is that for any decision taken which concerns the potential of the community to, leave, to live its normal communal life free of any undue um, interferences, there ought to be four members of the ACC concurring with the decision, as well as the leader of the ACC. The current leader of the ACC is Mr. Angampigwa, who is the traditional leader of the region. The community and region in which IAMC has mining operation interest in, in, in is one which is home to the ancestors of the Shikilnim Senga community for over 200 years. However, due to its remote location, the community forefathers were forced to move north of the region. For generations, they relied on the informal economy by farming and selling vegetables, livestock, and the making and selling of pottery for their, for their substance. Subsistence, rather. Due to the rich and nutrient soil in the region, as well as the proximity to the rivers, ravines, as well as desirable weather conditions, vegetables particularly thrive in the Shiklinim Senga community. Temba Malulege and Rosalind Digo, the first and second applicants, are fourth generation vegetable farmers and have been able to send their children to schools utilizing the proceeds of their vegetable farming. Budipo Oswa, the third applicant, is in Nyanga and Sangoma in the community, and he's able to run his practice successfully due to a plethora of plants and natural minerals abound, which are essential to the traditional medicine he prescribes, and he has been doing so for the past 20 years. Budipo Oswa learned everything he knows about traditional medicine from his mother, perhaps his mentor and teacher. Gogo Mtembu, the fourth applicant, Gokom Tembu is the region's leading traditional healing scholar in Sangoma. She learned everything she knows from her elderly family members who in turn learned it from their elders. Gokom Tembu also heads the Shiklinim Senge Traditional Healers Group, which is a federation of traditional healers advocating for the rights of traditional healers in related and similar circumstances. Essential to the training and practice of their, of their traditions is the access to water sources such as rivers and or ravines within the region. They use water as a spiritual element of connection to their ancestors. The community, as is throughout the region, has buried their loved ones on communal cemetery grounds. This is open to all members of community. The ability to access grave sites has also been an integral part of cultural and traditional practices for the Shiklini Msenge community. In line with the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act, MPRDA for short, and related sources, IAMC approached the ACC to facilitate consultation engagements in preparation for the desired mining operations to commence. At the final cons consultative session between IMC and the ACC, one member of the council took it upon himself to consent to the mining within the, within the community land. The measures and consultation thus went as far as the ACC and, and the community did not participate in the negotiations. IAMC, during their consultations as per the MPRDA and related sources requirements, consulted with the ACC and negotiated the potential of relocation of the community for the behalf or perhaps for the benefits of mining operations. For the majority of the negotiations, the ACC was fully constituted. However, in the final negotiation session, the leader of the ACC, Mr. Mpigwa, was absent due to his ill health, and this found, or perhaps, and this found another council member, Mr. Nkopodi, acting as the chairperson of the session. At the final negotiation session, Mr. Nkopodi told IAMC, you have come to the right people for the consultations because standing before you are the voice and authority of the Shiklinim Senga community. With that being said, the IAMC authorities understood the statement as being informed by the comments and sentiments of the community as well as that of the ACC. The IAMC made their presentations and were told that the council needed time to deliberate and vote when fully constituted and that they would inform them of the setting of another meeting to convey their decision. Four hours later, Mr. Ngopo sent an email to the IAMC officers giving consent for the mining operations to go forth and stipulating that the council agreed to the relocation of the community, but with a few conditions. 
that a school for the blind should be built by IAMC as, as per the community upliftment program in terms of the guidelines of the mining charter requirement for requirement for mining companies to uplift the community that they are mining in and to, to also make him, Mr. Ngopo, did the director of the said school. IAMC agreed with these conditions after a consultative process and a communication from Mr. Ngopo, the IAMC came to request the ACC to move to a designated area to afford them the space to mine. However, the community refused to move, stating that they were not consulted, and Mr. Nkopo had never received a mandate to act on their behalf. And the school for the blind has always been his passion and wish that was previously outvoted by their leaders and the ACC. The ACC also refused the, re also refused the relocation as it did not agree to same. The community further stated that their land, which has ancestral homes, rivers, and ravines used in traditional practices, royal cemeteries, plentiful soil, and livestock are all located in the Shiklini Msenge community and the Bogang region. However, however, the relocation settlement had already been concluded, signed, and notarized by Mr. Nkopodi. The relocation settlement contains the following information inter alia that the community should be relocated to the nearest, uh, nearest town and the graves in the cemeteries will have to be exhumed and relocated to the nearest city center graveyard and or alternative graveyard. With this being done, IAMC hired a private company called Forceful Removers to provide it with the services of removing the community. Forceful, remo forceful Removers came upon the community and conducted a forceful removal of the people, which included the elderly, the disabled, and the children, and livestock. This amounted to the community being stranded without shelter, food, and water. An NGO by the name Save the Culture, which is an unregistered which is unregistered in South Africa, but is advised courts in all the SADC countries, seeks to support the applicants in the matter. The NGO specializes in research and advocacy for the preservation of customary law and traditions of black Africans. They have documentary evidence, audio and video recordings of the harassment, intimidation, and forced removals that the affected individuals have gone through. This organization now seeks to join any litigation before the course as an amicus curiae. The conveners of Save the Culture believe that the intimate knowledge of the issues have led, or perhaps that have led to the conflict, coupled with a vast collection of evidence would be of assistance to the court. However, the respondents are opposed to the admission of Save the Culture to the proceedings, arguing that to do so would be a waste of the court's time and resources. They assert that the applicants would have who have ignored and treated with contempt the laws of the Republic cannot at the same time seek to benefit from those laws that they have been in contempt of. The applicants approached the Mtata Division of the High Court of South Africa, the High Court, seeking an order in their favor. They argued that, number one, the, the respondents violated their human rights, the President of South Africa and or, and or alternatively, the ministers responsible for human settlements, mineral resources and energy have failed to protect them against these lawful removals, unlawful removals under the guise of a resettlement. South Africa has failed to comply with the international obligations as necessitated by the AU and UN treaties and international customary law. So those, so those are the three arguments of the applicants in the High Court. The instructions to counsel. The matter was instituted in the High Court where the bench ruled in favor of the respondents. Due to the urgency and gravitas of the matter, the applicants seek, the, seek that the matter be entertained by the Constitutional Court on an urgent and direct basis. To determine, determine if the Constitutional Court has jurisdiction in this matter, given the applicants' desire to bypass the Supreme Court of Appeal, as counsel for the parties here under, you are instructed to prepare oral arguments for each of the parties, which will be heard in today's occasion. The following issues are before the court this morning. Issue one, the jurisdiction before the Constitutional Court. Issue two, direct access to the Constitutional Court. The applicants are desirous of approaching the Constitutional Court directly without first going to the, to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Issue three, the, cons the constitutionality of removal and resettlement of communities taking into account Section 25 of the Constitution. 
Issue four, the obligations of the South African government and the ministers, and as far as the right to human dignity, to the cultural, religious, and linguistic communities of the affected individuals are concerned. Issue five, the constitutional obligations of the Eastern Cape with regards to the provision of alternative housing. Issue six, the protection of children's rights. Issue seven, the admission of Save the Culture as amicus curiae before the courts. So that, in long or short, <laughs> um, encapsulates the issues and the facts that the parties will be deliberating on in front of the Honorable Court this morning. I have also been charged to just briefly read through the uh, rules of engagement that the parties will be uh, um, holding near to their actions and conduct this morning. Court etiquette. Participants must ensure that they, at all times during presentations, observe the decorum of the court. This will be done by way of demonstrating an appreciable courtesy to both the bench and the opponents during any rounds of the arguments. Further, participants should refer to the judges by the correct titles. At no time will the participants be allowed to interject a judge during questioning. Allocation of time. In all the rounds, one and two included, as well as the final here this morning, each regional team will be given 30 minutes to, to present their case, and it will be to the discretion of each team as to how to allocate their allotted time. The applicants will have to reserve time for the rebuttal for, from the 30 minutes. Maximum time for rebuttal is five minutes. No respondents, or perhaps the respondents, do not make a rebuttal. No team may allocate more than 15 minutes to each advocate, including rebuttal time. The clerk of the court will inform both teams and the judges about the time and when the time has expired. The judges may briefly extend the time to allow the team member to conclude their arguments. Last, um, ladies and gentlemen, is a scoring framework of the finals this morning. The scoring process in the finals will follow the process explained. The team with the highest score will be the winners of the competition. The three individuals with the highest scores will respectively be the best oralist of the competition, the first runner-up, and the second runner-up. The judges responsible for scoring the memorials heads of arguments will be responsible for choosing the best memorials for the competition. Lastly, once the scoring committee has, ta has, has tallied the score and determined the winner, the judges will announce the winning team and offer feedback. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all listening. And to test if you're all listening, I'm going to give you a quiz based on the hypothetical, except for the participants. Lady in the pink, what is the name of the NGO? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I almost gave you a heart attack. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you so much for lending us your ears. I hope now you know what the facts are. You're appreciative of um, what the participants had to go through, what they had to research in order to make their respective cases. And so um, we will then move on to the next part of the program. And lo and behold, we're actually now ahead of time. So that's good. Rather be early than late. Um, we, we're going to get uh, a word with regards to the objective of why we have the moot court. What is the objective of the moot court? From the lady that has ensured that we are here today, that the competition is running as smoothly as it is today, lady who would call me at uh, 10 at night to say, advocate, you haven't done this. So um, through her and her team, they've ensured that we are here today. Um, the project leader for the moot court this year, Ms. E. Nyabaza to the podium. Thank you so much. Uh, a very good morning to everyone. Um, what a wonderful day it is, if I may start. 
we anticipated the arrival of this day and I'm so happy that we finally arrived. Let me start by greeting everyone. I want to start by acknowledging uh, the, our professor of the College of Law, Professor O.J. Gole. I would like to also acknowledge our head of the law clinic, Advocate K.B. Muroda. I would also want to acknowledge the director of the School of Law, Professor A. Dube. I also want to acknowledge our judges who are here, uh, from Professor Kandelfinger to Judge Potterill and to Judge um, Basson and our Executive Dean, Professor M. Budel Nemakonde. We really appreciate your presence today. Um, also want to also acknowledge uh, my co-project uh, leader, Ms. Mumbati. I also want to acknowledge all the support staff. I wouldn't have done this uh, on my own, so I can't obviously take all the credit on my own. I do not want obviously to take much of your time. Um, if we look at the objective of the moot court, if a simple Google search will simply tell you that it's a mock uh, courtroom, or a mock trial. So that is why you find that whenever you choose the study of the LLB, it is quite important, obviously, to align yourself in your studies as to what you are preparing yourself for. You can't just enter the profession without obviously understanding how it is obviously a, a, a functioning in the legal fraternity. So at the end of the day, the moot court, it takes the assimilation of a real court. LLP students, they are sharpened their skills in researching, oral, uh, court etiquette, and presentation, obviously, of their arguments in a typical courtroom set up. That is why we here at UNISA, we feel that it is quite important that we ask um, the actually practicing judges who are there to be able to give us the directives as to what is expected of the participant in a typical courtroom setting. Because this is not only a journey for which is limited to this day. It's a journey to a beginning of a lifelong career of which when you look back in your seniority years, you will appreciate the start on this road because it gives you a picture on what is expected of you as a legal practitioner. So I want to also commend all the participants, those who made it to the final round and those who got knocked out. I want to commend your passion, your, your preparation, um, the time you took, obviously, drafting the, the heads, all that you put together. And I also want to commend even with the dress code, you understood the formal dress code, which is as, uh, expected at a court set up. So for me, it is a, a plus point which shows that they are prepared and the readiness to obviously enter into the uh, profession. So without further ado, I want to also say congrats, congratulations. And uh, we also still want to also further acknowledge, obviously, the trainers who also ensured the preparedness of this day. With that, I'd like to thank you and wish you all the best for today's day. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words. Um, one thing that, that resonated with uh, what she said was that it, this gives you an experience of a lifetime. Um, funny enough, I participated in the moot court in my student days, right sitting right here where you are. And see, it prepared me. Now here I am. So, uh, yes, and I'm on the winning team, some cases, depending on the judges. <laughs> so, thank you for the words, uh, Ms. Nyabaza. Thank you for the words. Um, we then move on to the, the second item, the other item. Um, we're going to, um, I'm going to bring forth the director for the School of Law, the man of international law, the foremost uh, expert of international law that I know, uh, and pilot by profession, 
Prof. Dube. <laughs> Thank you. All protocol observed. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And good morning also to the bench that has come to be with us today. My task is very simple. It is to do an introduction of the judges who are here today. I will begin with uh, Judge Anali Baison. Judge Baison was admitted as an advocate in 1985. Thereafter, she became a member of the Pretoria Bar in 2003 until 2007, July 2007. She was appointed a judge of the Labor Court from 1st July 2007 to 31 December 2015. A judge of the North Houteng Division of the High Court on 1st January 2016. An acting judge of the Constitutional Court from July 2018 to December 2018. An acting judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal from 1st June 2022 to 30 November 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, our second member of the bench today is Judge Suleb Potteril. Judge Potteril commenced her legal career as a prosecutor. She, then, she was then promoted to a senior prosecutor and thereafter a district magistrate and a regional magistrate. She was admitted as an advocate of the High Court and practiced as such from 1991. She did numerous acting appointments as a judge. She was appointed as a judge of the High Court in 2009. She has also acted as a judge in the Constitutional Court of our neighbor, Lesotho. And she was also an acting judge of the Houteng Division an acting, and was an acting judge in the Supreme Court of Appeals and an acting judge in the Constitutional Court and was an acting judge in the Land Claims Court. She's also had stints in the competition's um, appeal court and the land claims court. Ladies and gentlemen, I move on to the third member of the bench today, Professor Billy Gandolfinger. He is a specialist family law and criminal law defense attorney. He was appointed professor of law at UNISA in 2011. And aside from lecturing and updating UNISA study guides, he is the presenter of the UNISA Street Law Community Outreach Project, which has clinics in underprivileged communities and has for the past 12 years sat annually as a judge in the UNISA Interregional Mood Court competition. So Professor Kandalfinger is not new to what he's doing here today in this very same hall. He founded the ORT Black Students Bursary Program at UNISA in 1996, 1986, and he was appointed to the board of UNISA Foundation in 1998. He was also the chairperson of the board of trustees of the UNISA Foundation for 10 years. He was a counselor of the Law Society for six years. He was also a chairman of the family law, chairman of family law of the, Soci of the Law Society for 14 years. He was, a, he was a chairman of the disciplinary committee of the Law Society and the Fees Assessment Committee for 10 years, as well as chairman of the disciplinary monitoring committee of the Law Society for three years. He was also a chairman of the RT Bazari Trust for five years, Organization for Rehabilitation Through Training. That's what ORT stands for, not Ortambo International. <laughs> ORT operates in 40 countries and is one of the largest educational charities in the world. He was a director of ORT STEP Institute for 11 years, which was a science and technology project to upgrade black teachers in science, maths, and technology in seven provinces. He is a trustee of SHOUT, an NPO and NGO, which has to date built 13 libraries in underprivileged schools throughout South Africa. He has also provided PPE equipment during the pandemic to hospitals and frontline workers, and it also promotes education to children in literacy and numeracy programs. He is a fellow of the International Academy of Family Lawyers. He also acted as a judge of the High Court. Ladies and gentlemen, I move to the fourth member of the bench, one of our own, our acting Deputy Executive Dean, Professor Budeli, 
Professor Budel was admitted as an attorney in 2008. She joined UNISA in 2009 as a senior lecturer in the College of Law and was appointed as a professor in 2012. She was also appointed deputy dean from 2020 to today. In 2018, she was appointed as a commissioner of the SA Law Reform Commission, and she serves in that capacity to this day. Ladies and gentlemen, that sums up the quality of the bench that we have today to oversee the deliberations in this room. You are in safe hands. You have judges who have been there, judges who have not only taught the law, but have also practiced the law, and they have acted in various positions in various courts across not only the Republic, but across the Sadak region as well. Ladies and gentlemen, that is your bench. I thank you. Uh, thank you so much, the flying jurist. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's quite astonishing when you listen to the CVs of the judges and you take into account the combined legal knowledge that's just sitting in front of you. I mean, from appearing at the Constitutional Court, you know, to the Labor Court, the High Court, the land claims court, being commissioners of the law reforms. And I must say, um, most of this was done before some of you were born. <laughs> My 2000, Judge. <laughs> I'm not throwing shade, Judge. I'm just showing, throwing shade. <laughs> My apologies, Judge. <laughs> Moving swiftly along, I retract that. But <laughs> personal costs. Yes, I tender the personal costs. <laughs> Moving swiftly along, um, I would like to call um, a man where, who I met when I was still a student. Um, I was still, uh, I think, my undergrad. Um, and he came and gave a lecture and since then I wanted to work for him but uh, he never hired me. <laughs> I did. <laughs> but anyway, um, our stars realigned and now we are colleagues. Um, to give a message of support, um, the honorable and uh, special man Prof. Billy Gandolfinger to give a message of support. Prof. Thank you. Advocate Morata, the head of the clinic, asked me to inspire you. When I was a student and I attended lectures, I always looked at the lecturer and wondered how they had their journey. The journey from where you're sitting to where we're sitting is not a long journey, depending on how you map your life out. For most people, it's an accomplishment even to be here. I don't know whether you're aware, but we have, every year, we have approximately 180,000 applicants for LLB, and only 34,000 are successful. So for starters, you should consider yourself privileged to be here. <laughs> Getting here, and getting your fees paid is difficult for some people, which I can really feel for because of my own personal background. So I am the son of Holocaust survivors. 
Um, my first language is German. My parents came, were born in Germany and my grandparents and my whole family. Um, most of my family um, were murdered in the Holocaust. Um, my parents met here. They were both survivors. Only people that were left was my mother and her mother and my father and, and his parents. And they were, my father is the only man, and it's documented, that ever escaped twice from Dachau concentration camp in Germany. And we were brought up in very, I had a very different upbringing to everybody else because um, we lived in town. We were actually the only white family, even in those years, which obviously was under the apartheid regime. Um, we, we were poor. We, we shared an outside shower and toilet with our neighbors. Um, we had beds. We didn't even have a fridge. And as I said, my, my parents and grandparents didn't speak English. Um, I worked from when I was 12 years old in bottle stores, clothing stores, every holiday, every weekend. And when I was in matric, I used to sell pottery to florists in the afternoons. And when I, my father was a country traveler, which meant that, you know, he was really at home, often only on weekends. And my mother was a milner. She made hats from home. And when I did my matric, I got uh, a, a good matric in those days, a first class matric with distinctions, and I was in the newspaper. I was very independent. I knew my parents couldn't send me to university. And I went to the, uh, the Jewish helping hand, and I asked them to give me a bursary to go to Wits, which they readily agreed. And I took the forms to my father, <clears throat> and I used to have to read it to him because he didn't read English well. And uh, he said, what's this for? I said, just sign here and sign there. He said, it's not so fast. What, is this? what am I signing? <laughs> so I explained to him. I said, listen, I'm, you know, I want to be a lawyer, and I'm going to bits. He said, that's very interesting. Who's paying for this? So I said, well, this organization, they'll pay. And he said, do I have to pay them back? I said, no. So he said, come here. So I went there, and he gave me a flat end. I said, what was that for? It wasn't uncommon for my father. He expressed himself in, very, in graphic terms. He was a very good man. Though. And um, he said, I've never taken charity from anybody, and I'm not starting today. So if you want to become a lawyer, find another way. So I went into town, and I went to the high court, and I went to the Attorneys Association, and, and I still remember I met a woman there named Mrs. Katzop, and I said, look, this is my position. How do I become an attorney? She explained to me, you can go to Wits at night. You can do five years of articles, and that's exactly what I did. And um, I qualified um, at the age of 23 when I started my practice. And the reason that I started my practice at the age of 23 was that I had had bosses since I was 12 years old. And I decided um, one day after a very trying armed robbery case where I actually met one of my best friends today. And he wasn't one of the robbers. He was the council. <laughs> and um, one of the council um, representing another of, of the accused. And... Should I just give everybody a chance to come in and sit down? Yes. Just pause there. Then we'll come in.
So as I was saying, um, I started my practice um, after doing, going to VITS, uh, working during the day uh, and going to varsity at night at the age of 23. The only problem was, as I said, after a case one day in Johannesburg, I decided that I wanted to open my own practice. And I was walking past Ned Bank in Fox Street and I walked in and I asked to see the bank manager and the lady asked me if I had an appointment and I said no. She said, well actually there's a Mr. Mike Leeming who's just today become an assistant manager. And uh, he's actually quite bored so I think he'll see you. And I saw him and I said, look I need an overdraft, I want to open a practice. And he said, that's great, how much do you need? And I told him and he said, right, well you know, what security can you give? I said, nothing. He said, what about your parents? I said, they've got less than I have. At that stage, I think I had a bed and a half, I said. And um, eventually, uh, after a long conversation with him, I persuaded him to give me an unsecured overdraft, where he kept telling me he thinks he's going to get fired. And he gave me the overdraft. I spent two-thirds of the overdraft, furnishing out the offices, paying the deposit, and waiting for clients. And I used to get stuck going to work because I had no petrol in my car. Those were tough times. But ultimately, this bank manager became the CEO of Nedbank. Isn't that incredible? And I'm still in contact with him. So... The point that I'm trying to get across to you is what you should do with what you, what you ultimately get. One of the, one of the things that, that really had a great impression on my life was going back to my childhood, as I said. We never had any cousins, uncles. My parents didn't have brothers, sisters, for the reasons that I told you. But there was a family that took us in on weekends. You know, we used to go to their, what, we th what I thought was a very fancy house in Orange Grove. It was the Goldstone family, and the son was Richard Goldstone. And he became my friend, and he was the chairman of Ort. And even I was 23, and I really couldn't afford to, he pulled me into Ort, which is, as, as you heard earlier, it's the Organization for Rehabilitation and Training a wonderful organization. And I used to, as you heard, I, you know, I was on the national executive of that organization and I was chairman for many years of that organization and Ord Step, where we, we ran um, programs to upgrade teachers in the, in the, um, uh, you know, the less fortunate communities. And that was the important lesson for me, that it's not, you, 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 from day one, you've got to say, and I'm going to leave you with this thought. I don't know if you're familiar with the president of America, J.F. Kennedy. He was the president in 1961, 35th president. And he said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. What I'm saying to you is ask not what the profession can do for you. Ask what you can do for the profession. And if you do those things, you will have a successful career because in life, it's not what you take out, it's what you put in. Thank you. Thank you so much for those inspiring words, Prof. I think um, the takeaway I get from it is that you have to be single-minded in your objectives. 
And despite the challenges, Prof wanted to be a lawyer, and he overcame all the challenges, even when he was faced with the challenge of just finances. You know, he had already received a bursary, but it wasn't accepted. He made another plan. That is, I think, the takeaway, that despite the challenges, be determined on your goal and achieve it no matter what obstacles come in your way. Um, I would also like to take a moment and welcome um, our guests from Butebo um, Tsebo Secondary School. Am I pronouncing that properly? Please correct me. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, our young colleagues there at the back are aspirant lawyers. They come all the way from the Val to come and watch this moot court to be inspired. Um, I'm told that they're in grade 10, grade 11, and 12. Um, with, um, they come here being inspired to be lawyers. And I think you caught the better half of the story from Prof stating that he himself wanted to be a lawyer and he himself found himself in a position like many of us face um, before we come into varsities, the aspect of funding and many other socioeconomic challenges, but those were overcome. And I think that is testimony of you being here today. It shows your determination that at such a young age, you're already attending moot court competition, moot court competitions. It shows that you are indeed determined to become legal practitioners one day. And I hope to see you in court one day as well. Um, with that said, um, I see that we are running ahead of time, which is surprisingly odd for <laughs> any event, especially a UNISA event. <laughs> but anyway, um, it is time for our tea break. Um, I'm not sure as to whether the logistics are set up um, for us to take the tea so that we can then begin with the actual program of the day, which is hearing the real legal arguments um, be, uh, that we've come for. Mr. Sipo, are we ready with the logistics? Yes, advocate. Thank you, sir. You know I trust you, my leader. Yes, it's only 10 minutes. All right, so we're going to adjourn for a tea break for just 10 minutes so that um, the, the respective uh, participating teams can settle their nerves and do their final preparations and then so that the judges themselves can also be ready for us. And then we're going to have just 10 minutes for tea and then court will then commence in 10 minutes. It is currently 10.21. So at 10.31 on the dot, we commence. So considering that Prof is German, half German, so we're going to follow Swiss German time. Not South African time, Swiss German time. Thank you so much. 10.31. I missed out on it. You missed out on me. I'm actually practicing.
We are we settling down. <clears throat> hey. We are three minutes late, but it's not too bad. Um, I think we are only just waiting on the judges. Maybe one of the ushers could just check in as to where the judges are, because it's time for us to commence. In the meantime, um, I have to do something. As I'm not the referee, um, I'm like the fourth official in a soccer game. So we are going to have a coin toss to determine which team is the applicants and which team is the respondents. I would like one team member from each team to come to the fore and then decide as to whether they are heads and the other one would then obviously be tails. 
I just learned today, interesting fact, that the coat of arms side is actually the heads. So, yes, I've been doing it wrong all my life. <laughs> so, one representative from each team, please. I think um, you heard, okay, for, for the record, um, Team Rustenburg will be the applicants and Team Cape Town will be the respondents. While we wait for the judges, does anyone have any interesting stories to tell us? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, they're at the door, so when they walk in, I'll just say all rise and then just to follow court protocol and then all will rise. All rise. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, judges, while you were enjoying the tea break, um, we went ahead just for the sake of being fair to everyone. I went ahead and became uh, the fifth judge. On on the um, we did a coin toss to determine as to which team would be the applicants and which team would be the respondents. <coughs> And the result are as follows. The team on your right, Team Rustenberg, will be representing the applicants today. And the team to your left, Team Cape Town, will be respect representing the respondents today. Those are the teams. And so... We are so ahead of time. <laughs> I'm going to use that to my advantage. <laughs> Maybe a five minutes dialogue. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, anyway, so um, am I, is my lord and my lady is ready? Yes. yes. Contestants, applicants, are you ready? Contestants, respondents, are you ready? Do not worry about your heads of arguments. Uh, the judges have your heads of arguments. So there's no need for hard copies. They've actually read through your heads of arguments. All right. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, in 
as the Romans would say it, let the games begin. Applicants, it's your case. Timekeepers, are you ready? Thank you. You may begin. As the court pleases, my name is Leah Onalen Nasuhule, and greetings to you, your justices. Can you spell your name out? L? Each, each, each one of you has a name. Okay. <coughs> my name is Leah with L E A H. And my surname is Sehule, S E H O O L E. With me, it's my co counsel, Mr. Carabo Pilani. It's K A R A B O P I L A N E for Pilani. And with Ms. Ria Mohedwe Moekwe, it's R E A M O T S E G. T, oh, okay, yeah, GTSE, all right, GTSE, sorry about that. <laughs> Her surname is Moekwa, M-O-E-K-W-A. We are here. We are in this court today on behalf of the applicants to appeal on the matter that was decided at the High Court. This matter was regarding the unlawful and, and um, unlawful and forceful removal of the Nsenga community, herein referred to as the fifth applicant. We argue that the respondents violated the fifth applicant's human rights. And the president and the minister have failed to protect them against the unlawful removal under the guise of the resettlement. We seek this court to give to grant us an order uh, to grant us an order integrating and restraining the respondents from using the land for mining purposes. If the court pleases, I now call upon my co-counsel, Mr. Karabo Pilani, to deal on the matter of jurisdiction and other matters. May it please the court. Good morning, your justices. As said, my name is Karabo Pilani. I will now proceed to deal with the issue of jurisdiction. We approach this court uh, using section 167 3B of the, uh, of the Constitution which uh, stipulates that the constitutional, met, uh, the constitutional court may hear constitutional matter. And any other matter, if the constitutional court grants leave to appeal on the ground that the matter raises an arguable point of law of general uh, uh, importance, which ought to be uh, considered by the court. And it may make decision as to whether the matter falls within its jurisdiction. In this case, the fundamental rights have been infringed of the fifth applicant. Uh, the fundamental rights are as follows. Human dignity, which is in section 10 of the Constitution, in that the fifth applicants were removed from their area in a violent and inhuman way. Their freedom of security and the right under section 12. They were removed in a violent way and they were threatened, treated uh, in a cruel and inhumane and degrading way. They were deprived of their right to uh, freedom and religion under section 15 of the constitution in that they were forced to, uh, to remove uh, their grave sites to be relocated in the city center.
Furthermore, the fifth applicant's right to property under Section 25 of the Constitution. In that the first, fourth, fifth, and sixth respondents have failed to take reasonable legislative measures within its available resources and foster condition which enable citizens to grant access to land on equitable basis. The uh, fifth applicant was forcefully removed from their houses and were left stranded without food, water, and shelter. So they are uh, socio-economic rights uh, under section 26 uh, and 27 were, were also infringed. They are culture, religious, and linguistic uh, rights under section 31 were also infringed when they, they were removed. I now proceed to deal with the issue of direct appeal. We seek the Constitutional Court uh, to grant us a direct appeal as enshrined in Section 167, Subsection 6 of the Constitution, as read in line with uh, Rule Number 19 of the Constitution. Uh, leave to appeal to this, it says that leave to appeal to this court will be granted where the intended appeal raises constitutional matters, and it is in the interest of justice that such leave be granted. And this court may grant leave to appeal on the ground that the matter raises an arguable, uh, of, uh, an arguable point of law of general public importance. We do so under Rule 19 of the Constitutional Court Rules. Uh, which stipulates that a litigant who is aggrieved by the decision of a court and who wishes to appeal against it directly to the court on a constitutional matters shall within the time specified which the appeal is sought to be brought and after giving notice to, to the other party or party's consent, lodge with the registrar an application for leave to appeal. Provide as the court proceeds. Uh, are you seeking direct access and leave to appeal, or only one of them? As the court proceeds, we are call, uh, we are seeking direct appeal. <coughs> Both. You, you don't have it. Yeah. So either you are asking direct access, or you appealing against the lower court's judgment, and you're asking that the constitutional court, in fact. Um, hear the appeal, but skipping the SCA, because it's a constitutional issue. As the court pleases, we are seeking uh, the direct access. Okay, thank you. And we are doing so under Rule 90 of the Constitutional Court, as the, there is an order that was decided at the High Court. Now we want to appeal against that order. I will now go on to deal with uh, the matter of uh, interest of justice, because it's a leg that we are coming uh, to argue this matter. It's a Sorry, Councillor. Why, why do you think that the Constitutional Court is the appropriate court, as opposed to this matter going to the Supreme Court of Appeals? As, as the court places, due to the gravity and the agency of this matter, we are saying, we, we, we are saying that this matter is agent. As the children and uh, the community have been forcefully re uh, removed from their uh, area, and now they are stranded on the street without food, water, and shelter. Hence, we are saying this matter is urgent and it needs to be heard in this court. So are you bringing it on an urgent basis? Because I don't see, are you bringing, and why would it be heard quicker at the Constitutional Court than at the SCA? As the court pleases, uh, due to, to the gravity 
uh, because people are now on the streets and if it may be taken to the Supreme Court of Appeal, uh, it may need to be also appealed to the Constitutional Court if the uh, a matter goes against the applicant. I now seek to deal with the matter of save the culture to be admitted as amicus curiae. Save the culture seek to be admitted as amicus curiae. Uh, we do so under Rule 10 of the Constitutional Court rules. We stipulate that, subject to this rule, any person interested in any matter before the court may, with written consent of all parties in the matter before the court, given not later than the time specified, be admitted there in as amicus curiae. Upon such terms and conditions, with such rights and privileges as may be agreed upon in writing, with all parties before the court as may be directed by the Chief Justice in terms of sub rule three. We are aware that the respondents are opposed to uh, the admission of amicus curiae. Therefore, we invoke sub rule four of rule 10 of the Constitutional Court rules, which uh, states that if a written consent referred to in sub rule one has not been secured, any person who has an interest in any matter before the court may apply to the Chief Justice to be admitted therein as amicus curiae. Chief Justice may grant such application upon such terms and conditions with such uh, rights and privilege as he may decide. It is then that we are bringing this uh, application of amicus curiae. Uh, Can you refer me to where this is addressed in your of argument? What, what As the court pleases, it is addressed in page 20 of the Heads of Argument. Uh, oh, sorry, I was paragraph. watching a colleague. What did you say? Please repeat. As the court pleases, it is addressed in page 20 of the Heads of Argument, paragraph 60. I've quoted, I've quoted uh, Rule 1 and Rule 4. Yeah, then we don't have the correct head. Uh, unless I've opened the wrong head. Are you Rustenberg? As the police. And um, it must be your heads of arguments for the applicant. As the court pleases. It only goes up. And this understatement of arguments, there's something, no, it doesn't open. Yeah, we've only got up to paragraph 42, and then we've got conclusions. But if it's in your head, that's fine. Continue, we'll listen to you. We, we have an extra file we can give the court. That's very file. kind. Thank Good. you very much. Take leave to hand it up. As the court pleases, uh, save the culture, seek to be admitted as an amicus curiae, and then it does so under rule six, uh, under sub rule six, uh, which is found in uh, page 21 of our heads. Uh, save the culture was, uh, have witnessed the atrocity, uh, atrocities that happened on that day. And then they have the video recordings, audio, and uh, the documentary evidence that they seek to bring with, uh, in this court in order to uh, help this court to come to a decision. And they, uh, we, we, uh, the respondents, the applicants believe that uh, the amicus curiae will, will advance this court. And without that evidence, uh, the court will not have sight of what actually happened. So that evidence will help this court. 
as the court places are. Uh, I, or you is the app, or the applicants not in possession of that evidence? They are not. Uh, the people, uh, the save the culture, is the one who took the videos and the 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 the, 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 the audio uh, recordings at that particular day. And does it expand on what the app applicant sees in its founding affidavit? As the court places, it is in line with. So it's nothing new. It's nothing new. Can you just briefly please on the legal standing of the applicants to approach them? As the court places, uh, section 88 of the Constitutional Court, which deals with uh, enforcement of rights, uh, state that the person who may approach a court are anyone acting in the public interest. And the applicants in this case are acting in the public interest. And the amicus is an association acting in the interest of its members. As the court pleases, the Shitwingi Msenge the fifth applicants are the community. So hence they, 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 they are coming here as the community. I now seek to hand over to my co counsel to deal with. Sorry, before you hand out, you, you referred to the, the amicus curia and why they should be admitted, correct? As the court pleases. Can you tell me about the BioWatch principle? As the court pleases, the BioWatch principle uh, uh, stipulates that if an amicus curiae comes to mislead the court or say anything that is outside the, 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 the ambit of what uh, it's supposed to do, the cost should go to, uh, to the amicus curiae. It must incur the cost think, of the cost. You must, uh, you must just do a bit of research and then you can address us on that. I don't think you've got it right. As the court pleases. I know him. If, you if, if you're in court and you don't know when a judge puts something to you, then you must, uh, you must say that you'd like to just stand down and uh, consider it and then you come back. As don't just shoot from the hip and, and guess. As the court pleases. May I now hand over to my co-counsel? When, when she's finished, I want you to tell us, Councillor, uh, when, when she's completed, then I want you to address us on, the, on that principle on the biowatch principle. As the court pleases, Justice's greetings. My name is Ryan Petumu Eba, and I stand here on behalf of the Just Just spell your name, please. Section 25, subsection 2 of the Constitution, it 
further states that the property may be expropriated only if it's in the purpose or the interest of the public. We submit that the mining operations were not done in the public's interest, as it did not comply with the constitution, the rules, and the obligations of the seventh appellate of the, of the seventh applicants. One of the express provisions of, se of the seventh applicant's constitution is that any decision taken which concerns the community in order to live in harmony, there ought to be a leader, two members or four members of the traditional council. However, Mr. Nkopodi, as the member of the traditional council, took consent unilaterally, which violated the schedule, schedule, schedule one of subsection 2 of the Traditional and Cohesion Leadership Act 3 of 1991, of 20, 2019, which further states that a member must act in good faith and in the, in the interest of the public, and therefore a member may not use the office of power to gain personally and not in the public's interest. Furthermore, we submit that the Minister of Mineral Resources failed to exercise his power in terms of Section 47 of the Minerals, Petroleum and Resources Development Act to suspend or cancel the mining right of the seventh respondent. Can I interrupt you there? The, the deprivation of the possession of the property, was it done unlawfully? The deprivation of the, of the, of the she claims saying a community was done unlawfully because they were forced forcefully removed from their land by the forcible the removers who and did it, did they have the right to do it because they were ordered to do so. As the court pieces your justices, they they got permission from Mr. Nkopodi that the community agree that they will be moved to the city centre. However, the community did not agree. There was no court order, your justices, as the court cases. As the court cases, your justices, according to section 5, subsection 4C of the Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development, there should be consultation with the community, including the, the, the community. However, Mr. Nkopodi alone gave consent without consulting the community members.
So I must be on read. Yes. As the court pleases, my lord. The South African government and the minister failed to protect the Shiklinim Seng community. In section 10 of the constitution, which is the human dignity, the government and the minister has obligation to protect and promote inherent dignity of all individuals. In the case of S versus Makwanyani, paragraph 10, it states that every person shall have the right to respect for and promotion of his dignity. Furthermore, the right to cultural, the cultural right in terms of section 31 of the constitution states that the minister and the, the, the minister and the government are obliged to respect, promote, and pro protect and fulfill the cultural rights of the individuals of the communities. Furthermore, the religious rights in section 31 states that the minister and the government must respect and protect the right to freedom of religion, belief, and opinion. In paragraph one of the Maledu case versus Itireling and Bakata states that on page 26 of the heads of argument, I mean seven, 26 of the heads of argument, it states that thus strip someone of their source of livelihood and you strip them of their dignity too. In terms of the National Act 61, National Health Act 61 of 20, 2003, the regulation states that there ought to be, there, there has to be requirements in order for the exhumation to take place. And Mr. Nkopodi has notarized and signed the relocation and further stated that stated that they, they can exhume the gravesite and, and move them to the, gra to the city center. As the court pleases your justices, I may now hand over to my co-counsel to deal with the rest of the issues. As the court pleases, I'll be dealing now with the issue of the provisions of the alternative housing. The respondents in this matter have violated the first applicant's right to adequate housing. Section 26 of the Constitution states that everyone has the right to access uh, adequate housing and the state must take responsible legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve, <clears throat> to achieve the progressive realization of this right. When I relate this um, section to this present case, is that the respondents, in as much as they forcefully removed the applicants from their forefathers' home, they did so in an inhumane way and then expected that the applicants to move to the city center, not considering the fact that how will they maintain themselves as we know that the, applica uh, the applicants were marginalized. These people won't be able to afford the living expenses in the city center. And this is why in our facts that it was stated that these people have been relying on informal settlement and that place has been their home play, uh, homeland for over 200 years. When they took uh, the, the fifth applicants and forcefully remove them from their houses, they left them stranded because they cannot go to the city center if they cannot afford it. They cannot take their kids, their kids to school, those expensive schools that uh, they expect uh, without giving them the mandate or some sort of uh, environmental plan on how they're gonna help them or assist them with the grant going forward. And instead, they went on to also infringe the rights of the respondents in section 27 of the constitution. Whereas in as much as they're in the streets, they do not have water, they do not have shelter, they cannot even give the children the adequate uh, family care as well. So I submit, um, in the case of the protection of children's rights, they also brutally, as mentioned from the facts of the case, that they brutally took the disabled and the children 
and forcefully remove them from that place, which also could have caused stress, embarrassment to the community at large. Doing so, it is inhumane that the, uh, the respondents didn't even have any some sort of remorse to the community as they knew that they have not been mining and operating in that land for over nine years and left the place abandoned. So the children who are also... Sorry, if they showed remorse, what would that be? If they could have showed remorse and understood, uh, went back to the community, they could have found out actually the facts that Mr. Uncle Bodhi was acting unilaterally to the community. Instead, they just took a decision that was done by one uh, community member and believe that community member is actually acting on behalf. But as we have mentioned, or my co-counsel has mentioned, that they were supposed to meet with the whole community at large so that they can consult the, the community. <coughs> then, if they could have been remorseful, they could have at least seen that these people, as much as they refused to move, then what is it that lacks? What is it they didn't do right to actually meet the requirements or the mandate that these people are seeking? They could have known that these people cannot even afford the life in the city centre. They could have known that they need the grants to sustain their lives in that city centre. My lady, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you they are yes. As the court pleases. Um, as the applicants, we pray that uh, the Honorable Court rules in our favor by retaining the community to their ancestral place, which will be, which will be in the best in, in, uh, interest of the children as they are of paramount importance and enshrined in, uh, as it is enshrined in Section 28 of the Constitution. We also pray that this court will be able to this court grant the applicants um, the applicants the application uh, if the application should succeed that uh, the applicants including the council actually pay for the cost of the three councils at large <laughs> sorry as the court pleases um, thank you May it please the court, my lord and ladies, I was asked of the BioWatch case. Uh, it is respectfully dealt in page 5 of our heads, uh, paragraph 17. Uh, so the judgment uh, in the BioWatch, uh, it, it, it makes clear that the dispute between parties involves, if the dispute between parties involves the protection and assertion of a party's constitutional rights, that party cannot be settled with the cost uh, order in the event that the uh, application is unsuccessful. May it please the court. Uh, in this case, if uh, this application is unsuccessful, we, uh, we are seeking that the, the cost be uh, taken to the respondent. Does the court have a discretion? As the court pleases, a, a, indeed the, a, a court does have the district, uh, discretion uh, to make an order uh, in that regard. If the court pleases, I now rest my case. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I'm just sorry to interrupt the proceedings. Um, just as a house rule, um, if you're on the podium, you can just press the, the microphone and then it should go red. It should not flash red, but just go red. And it will be red for five minutes and then it should automatically switch off. You need to press it again so that your voice can be projected and audible to everyone. And then if there's an interjection, 
kindly press your microphone to be off and then the judge will press their microphone to be on and then theirs will become red. If yours flashes green, it means you on the floor, you're recognized, but you cannot be projected to everyone. So it's, it's like in parliament, basically. So yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Justice Kalosni. Justices, there are four preliminary issues that arise in this matter, those being jurisdiction, local standing, direct appeal, and urgency. On the first two, I will not address the court as there is no dispute as you are with the applicant, and those are jurisdiction and local standing. And what then remains is the issue of direct appeal and urgency. Before I address urgency, I need to make it clear or note that as the respondents at this moment, we are not sure whether there is confusion on our side on how the applicants seek to approach this court. In a response to Justice uh, Portillo's question, counsel, first counsel for the applicant answered that they approach this court via direct access, but then in the next, next sentence said that it is an appeal from the High Court. Nonetheless, our understanding is that this is a direct appeal in terms of section 176B, 176, 176B, correction, and it is tried that it provides that when it is in the interest of justice and particularly using Rule 19, this court may be approached directly. Now, this particular court has dealt with the application of section 176B and particularly the interest of justice hurdle in the case of member of the executive council for development planning and local government outing versus the Democratic Party and others. In paragraph 32 of that judgment, and the justices will find this uh, quotation in paragraph 11 of our head, this court stated the following, and it was penned by Charles Charles MP, and I quote, in deciding what is in the interest of justice, each case has to be considered in the light of its own facts. A factor will always be that direct appeals deny to this court the advantage of having before it judgments of the SCA on matters in issue. 
where there are both constitutional issues and other issues in the appeal, it will seldom, it will seldom be in the interest of justice that the appeal be brought directly to this court. Close quote. Now, Justices, two important things emerge from this passage. The one being that this court confirms in this judgment that direct appeals, a correction, that it sees judgments of the SCA on matters in issue as an advantage when it has to hear a matter. And secondly, where a matter does not only contain a constitutional issues, but other issues as well, it will seldom, seldom be in the interest of justice to appeal directly to this court. Now, the use of the word seldom suggests to us that an applicant must prove exceptional circumstances before they may rely or they may succeed on a direct appeal. And this was confirmed in absolute terms in the United Democratic Movement versus Speaker of the National Assembly and others by this court. The question then becomes, Justices, what are the exceptional circumstances in this case that warrant a direct appeal? From looking at the facts and having had the benefit of hearing our learned friends on the other side, it seems to us that the exceptional circumstances claimed center around the homelessness of the community. Now, if we go back to the facts, it is right that before the eviction took place, the mining company, IAMC, entered into a relocation settlement agreement with Mr. Nkopodi, a member of the ACC. And within this relocation agreement was a <clears throat> provision for alternative housing. Now, we submit that our client as the IMC has not reneged on that agreement and is still willing to make it available, even if on a temporary basis, for the proceedings to be ongoing while the, while the, the applicants have sheltered. We submit, Justices, that it is the applicant's refusal to make use of available shelter which creates the exceptional circumstances, and therefore we would submit that the, the, the exceptional circumstances claimed or advanced for the direct appeal are, lack of a better word, self-created. It seems to us unreasonable for the applicants to hold our justice system at ransom, advancing uh, exceptional circumstances that they create themselves. Furthermore, Justices, this matter is not just a matter about the constitutional issues. There are mining rights issues, there is property issues, property law, mining law, and therefore this court would benefit and the entire jurisprudence of this country will benefit from a judgment of the SEA on matters in issue. This then brings me to the second preliminary issue of urgency, and we deal with this in paragraph 19. Now, our applicants have failed to establish the test for urgency, so unfortunately that burden now rests on us to establish what is the, 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 the test for urgency, and they have to apply to the facts. We could just leave it, but I wouldn't if I were you. Okay. <laughs> I'll briefly uh, rush through it, uh, Justice uh, Poterov. It is right that the test for urgency, the primary investigation, is first and foremost, the applicant must show that there will be an absence of substantial redress in the ordinary course, and thereafter there are secondary factors which ought to be considered, which include self-created urgency, prejudice to the respondents, or prejudice to the... Uh, uh, administration of justice. For the same reasons we advanced in our um, attack on a direct appeal, we submit that urgency should also fail for the same reasons. I will then move on, Justices, to the substantive issues, but before I do, there's an interesting issue that came up uh, during the council, uh, during the submissions for counsel for the applicant. It seems to us that the nub or the crux of the case advanced by the applicants rests on the assertion that the applicants are the lawful holders or right holders of the land due to the fact that their ancestors occupied the land uh, centuries ago. Now, as I, will, as I will show, this approach is clearly incorrect. We wish to invoke the intertemporal principle, which is a principle of international law, which this court must consider as enjoined by section 391B. This principle simply states that a legal question has to be assessed on the basis of the laws relevant at the time. So what this means is that if we are to assess the situation of the property or the ownership thereof, we have to assess it using laws that were relevant at the time when the ancestors occupied the land. In paragraph 2.6, uh, or in clause 2.6 of the set of facts, it is clear there that the ancestors of the applicants abandoned the land due to its remote nature. So they were not happy that it was in a remote location, so they abandoned it. The applicants or the ancestors therefore never maintained any contact with the land until the mining right was granted and they, 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 the current applicants resettled on the land. Now the relevant laws that were applicable at the time are the common law and the customary law. At common law level, we know that this abandonment of the land 
rendered the, 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 the land rest nullius, when being that it, be, it belonged to no one when it was abandoned. On the customary law side of things, the customs and practices during that time, it is also common cause that the, the, the people living that time were nomadic. They would settle on the land, use it for its benefits, and when it was no longer useful to them, they, were, they would abandon and move to uh, other land, abandoning what is left behind. It is also common cause that in order for the land to pass to next generations and next generations, the ancestors need to at least keep contact with the land, which did not happen in this case. We therefore submit that the reliance by the applicants on the interim protection of informal land right act is misplaced. Firstly, the background to the act states that when the constitution came into effect in 1996, it sought to restore what had been lost by recognizing, protecting the underlying land rights of vulnerable people. It sought to give secure tenure to land for people that had been deprived of hundreds of years as a result of racist and sexist colonial and apartheid law policies and practices. The, the, the ancestors of the applicants were not deprived of their land due to racist, sexist, colonial, and apartheid laws and policies. They abandoned the land because it was no longer useful to them and therefore leaving it owners ownerless. Therefore, justices, if the foundational basis of the applicant's case is to fall, then we submit that it is doubtful for us that the, what, what you are is built on top of the foundation should not fall also. I move on then to the obligations of the South African government and ministers in as far as constitutional rights are concerned. It is tried that the right to dignity, free practice of culture and religion are provided at two levels, at an international law and a domestic level. And what happens at both levels is that the rights are provided for and then a corresponding positive obligation is placed on the governments to protect, respect and promote and fulfill these rights. But what we have not been told is that there is a particular standard that failures of the state are to be judged against. And again, we seek to invoke the international law by virtue of Section 391B of the Constitution, and we look to get the standard from the European Convention on Human Rights, and particularly the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. Two things appear from the jurisprudence of the European Court. The one is that positive obligations are not open-ended, they are subject to limitations. And the second is this, they must be judged reasonably and applied in a way which does not impose an impossible or disproportionate burden on authorities given the choices they face and the unpredictability of human conduct. We submit that this standard has been endorsed by this court in cases like Carl Michel versus the Minister of Security. Justices, now the, the, the obligations are twofold. Right? There is a legislative component to it and then there is a day-to-day -day running of the state practical component. On a legislative side of things, we submit that the state has fully complied it is as, as it has enacted the MPRDA, the Mineral uh, and Petroleum Resources Development Act, which seeks to protect these rights, and also the Interim Protection of Land Rights Act. Simply as I conclude is that, Justices, what the problem with this case is that there are no sufficient detailed facts on which to use the pro using the appropriate standard to pronounce on any state failures. Simply briefly, I shall make the following examples. Firstly, we do not know, according to the facts, how much time passed between the eviction and the lodging of the matter at the High Court. Secondly, there are no facts which point to when the matter was, recorded, was reported to the authorities or if it was reported at all. Let's take an example. Let's say we want to hold accountable the SAPS for not responding to, to, to the unlawful eviction. All we know on the facts is that this is in a remote area. We do not know how far the nearest police station is, how well resourced is that police station, and we know that in, the, in the Eastern Cape, we have examples where the remotest of villages are 100 and 200 kilometers away from the nearest uh, uh, SAPS police stations. We simply, then justices, highlight this, that in the absence of such crucial detailed facts, it is virtually impossible to assess the state's obligation reasonably and in a way that does not impose an impossible or disproportionate burden on authorities given the choices they face and given the unpredictability of human conduct. Therefore, in the absence of such facts, and, or, and, and using the principle or the obligation to exercise judicial constraint, this court should steer away from making any pronouncement on state failures where there are no sufficient facts for an assessment to do so. I will leave it there, Justices, uh, as my time is up. And if you please, the court, I will invite my little friend, Mr. Tom Walker, to address the court on issues. Sorry, on which, what issues is he going to do? On the third issue, And your other colleague? Our colleague will deal with the children's rights and the admission of amicus and end off with our prayer. OK. 
Okay, thank you. This is the court. Good morning, Justices. My name is Lubabado Fongwaka. On the matter before this court, I'm appearing in the, on behalf of the respondents. Justice, the issue in which I'm going to deal with is the constitutionality of the removal and the resettlement of the, of the community Shekhan and Singh people. Justice, in terms of Section 25 of the Constitution, it is clear that in order for a deprivation of land to take place or to be constitutionally permissible, a law of general application is required. And secondly, in terms of 25 2A, it is also permitted uh, 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 the IMC together with the state to expropriate land in terms of general application, which is the purpose now in, in this case before the court to submit that is in the public interest of the, of the, of the is in the public interest of the community, sorry. Justice is, this is an, there is an important feature of these two provisions, which is that they require a law of general application to be applicable in order for the deprivation of land to be constitutionally permissible. For that reason, Justice is to submit that, the law of which we submit that was applied in this case was the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act, here on referred to as MPRDA. If the citizens can pay attention to paragraph 30 to 31 of our heads of argument, where we submitted that section 2A section of the MPRTA embodies the recognition of the country's mineral and petroleum resources, which vest in the state as one of its primary objectives. And also, in terms of section 2B of the MPRTA, gives effects to the principle of the state's custodianship of the nation's mineral and petroleum resources. Further justices, in Panganyama Yamaswazi and others, besides, mineral, besides, besides Minister for Mineral and Resources and others, in this case, the court held that, in broad terms, the Act seeks to attain its transformation and empowerment aims by making the state the custodianship, the custodian of the country's mineral and petroleum resources, and by placing control of such in, by placing control of the exploitation of these resources under the control of the state. Section 2H of the MPRTA gives effects to Section 24 of the, of the Constitution by ensuring that the nation's mineral and petroleum resources are developed in an orderly and ecologically sustainable manner, while promoting justifi justifiable and social and economic development. So, Justice, what we have established at this point is that the MPRTA gives custodianship of the minerals to the state and at the same time burdens the state with the duty, to, to the duty of economic development. So, Justice, it is common cause that the IAMC obtained a prospective right and mining right after having followed all the legal requirements. It is clear in terms of section 5 of this act that, that a right of production granted in terms of this act is a limited real right in respect of the minerals or petroleum and the land in which such right relates. Further justices will submit that this was confirmed in ACT in South Africa versus Minister for Minerals and Energy. And some of these uh, legal requirements, justices, are those found in Section 10 of the MPRTA and Section 33 of the regulations of this particular act. In terms of Section 10, subsection 1, justices, it is clear that this section invites uh, uh, the, the affected parties and also the interested parties to, to, to within, uh, uh, within 14 days after the, upset, after the upsetting of an application lodge in terms of Section 16, M22 or 27. It is clear according to this act that the regional manager must, in the prescribed manner, I quote, make known that an application for prospecting right, mining right, or mining permit has been received in respect of the land in question, and called upon interested and affected parties or persons to submit their comments regarding the application within 30 days from the date of the notice. For that reason, justices, we submit that all the above requirements were fully met before IMC was granted the mining right. And this implies that the community was made aware of the impending mining operation and on, on, on the land in question. And the community did not raise any objections when the impending mining operations were made known to them. In terms of section three, subsection three of the regulations, it is clear that whenever after this right or, or this application has been received, what needs to be done is that there must be a publication in the applicable provincial gazette. 
which was done, has the facts of the case proved that all the requirements of the acts were complied with. And also, there must be also an notice in the magistrate court area, which is the land in question is situated. And also, there must be advertisement in a, in a local municipality newspaper, which circulates to, a, to, to that area. So just this is the applicants in this case, they've never ever come forward to, 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 to object to the mining, but after, but, but after the mining rights were granted, that's when they abruptly decided to come and, uh, and, and, and make use of, of, of the land in question. So just this is the, 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 the notion that there was no consent on Mkopodi, based on their failure to do so, we submit that they, they, they gave consent, but the consent in which they gave was implied in its nature. So just this, we submit that this is a matter that, uh, uh, that is about the two competing scales, where one is the economic imperative and desirable achievement to resuscitating an, econo an, an economic growth in South Africa through the operation of the country's minerals, and the other, the community's right to occupation. So just this, we submit that these two competing scales need to be assessed on the background of the state's empowerment by Section 25, 1 and 2, and the conduct of the IMC and the conduct of the community. Further, we submit that the community was malafide in its approach in, in that it ignored calls for representation and decided to make use of the land when IMC had already obtained a limited rail right in the land in question. And just this is when viewing these competing scales, we submit that given the malafide conduct of the applicant, and on the other hand, economic imperative which the state seeks to achieve, the removal of the community is in line with the section 25 of the constitution. And further, just this is in terms of section 25 of the constitution, we submit that this is the section that permitted the, 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 this expropriation of, the, the expropriation of land. If justice is the court can pay attention to Mkondwana versus Nelson Mandela Metropolitan, the court was of the opinion that where the deprivation is minimal, what needs to be done is a rational connection between the means and ends would be adequate. So further justice, the court went further to say the, 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 the deprivation Will be, a, will be constitutionally permissible if it's proposed, it's a governmental purpose in its nature. So justice is we submit that this court must find that section 25 of the constitution was complied with in this regard. For, because of the time constraints, I would now like to invite my co-counsel, Mrs. Musega, to address the remainder of the issues. Please, the court. My name is Viola Tu Siolise Musoge, and I confirm my appearance before this court on behalf of the applicants. Justices, I will be dealing with two substantive issues, and that is the issue of the protection of the children's rights, as well as the application for the admission of Save the Culture NGO as amicus. And thereafter, I will be concluding um, the submissions on behalf of the respondents today. Because it's going to be a short, um, short issue that I'm going to be dealing with, I believe that the applicants have made it slightly easier for us. I will start with the admission of the Save the Culture NGO as amicus, and you will find that in paragraph 92 of our um, written submissions. Justices, the respondents do not contest the procedural rules that the applicants rely on to admit Save the Culture NGO as amicus, and that is in part five, part five of the Constitutional Court rules, Rule 10, and we acknowledge that we haven't given um, consent as is required by Sub Rule 1, so we do acknowledge that they do have recourse in Sub Rule 4, so we do not contest that. The merits, though, that they bring forth for admission of Save the Culture NGO are highly questionable. The only thing that they have put forth is that Save the Culture NGO is in possession of documentary and video evidence that will assist this court. Justices, I would like to explain to the applicants that when an amicus curiae makes an application to the Constitutional Court, it is to aid the Constitutional Court in expertise that the Constitutional Court does not have. And I believe, Justices, that a bench of a Constitutional Court does not need assistance to be able to see the, uh, um, the evident or evidence value in videos and in audio recordings. Justices, the jurisprudence of this constitutional court 
indicates that this court is not um, a court that easily admits what we would call noise makers or busy bodies. Amicus that does not have anything to add or to help this court with. This was confirmed, Justices, in the case of Jose versus Minister of Safety and Security, where the court held that just because an applicant meets the requirements to be admitted as an amicus, it does not diminish the court's control over the participation of the amicus in the proceedings. Justices, Save the Culture prides itself by being an organization that it has expertise in the cultural uh, matters of black Africans. We submit, Justices, that their um, role is not um, new evidence or um, any evidence that this court can use because within this community, we know that there are cultural experts who are seasoned in matters of advocacy for the rights of traditional leaders and related circumstances. One such is the third applicant who is Nyanga and Samoma, who's been practicing for over 20 years. The second is the fourth applicant, Ukwagom Tembo, who is the region's leading traditional healing scholar and she in fact mentored the third applicant. This community has a, a traditional healers um, forum that is well versed with matters of advocacy and with matters of advocating for their cultural rights. So we submit that Save the Culture NGO only comes on a research and academic level where the applicants have within their ranks something better, which is the lived experiences of the people who actually live this culture, who live this culture, they know it intricately and don't rely on research. Justices, further, um, in the case of National Treasury and others versus opposition of Urban Tolling Alliance and others, this court had made it clear that it is insufficient for a prospective amici to simply echo the position of the party with slight variation, and it cited that if its contentions are not new, then it should not be admitted. It is for this reason, Justices, that the respondents um, contest the admission of Save the Culture. It is an abuse of the court's processes to simply um, apply to be admitted just to hand over video and documentary evidence when they can just give it to the applicants for them to use it themselves. If it pleases the court, I will move on to the next substantive issue, which is the protection of children's rights. Justices, the applicants currently... Um, not mala fide, but they are abusing the process in the sense that they do not have a strong application. They can easily just hand over the documentary evidence instead of dragging the litigation process with, an uh, with the application to be admitted, and they don't bring anything new that will assist this court in any way. Thank you. Justices, section, the applicants came and they spoke about the constitutional rights of the children in this community as enshrined in section 28 of the constitution. They also spoke um, about the best interest of the child principle, which is found in section 28, subsection 2 of this constitution. I'd like to lay my foundation for our arguments with a statement from the case that we believe is very important. In the McCall versus McCall case, it was held that where a court is tasked with determining the best interest of the child, that court is not adjudicating a dispute between the antagonists with conflicting interests to resolve their discord. However, the court's biggest concern should be for the child. With that being said, Justices, the applicants came before this court and stated that it is the respondents that did not act in the best interest of the child. We submit that it is in fact the applicants who did not act in the best interest of the child. When the respondents um, concluded negotiations with the applicants under the bona fide impression that they had obtained the required consent, one of the commitments that they committed the blind children of this community who are currently without a formal education. This, Justices, is in line with Section 7, Subsection J of the Children's Act, which states that whenever the best interest of the child's principle is to be applied, one of the major considerations should be any disability that the child may have. The significance of this commitment, Justices, should not be taken lightly, as the importance of education was best characterized in the case of Center for Child and Others versus Basic Minister of Education and Others, where the court held, and I quote, today education is perhaps the most important function of the state and local government. Compulsory school attendance laws and great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition to the importance of education in our democratic society. It is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities, even 
services and the armed forces. It is the very foundation of good citizenship. So we submit justices that the respondents are giving these um, visually impaired children of this community who are currently without a formal education, the foundation, the very foundation of good citizenship through the school. In the case of JSH versus MSH and others, a mother was suing her estranged husband for private, fee school, um, private school fees. The respondent in that matter proved to the court that he could not afford these fees, but he had found an, a suitable alternative. The applicant then dragged the litigation process, which resulted in her children missing a considerable amount of time at school. The court held that Mrs. H's refusal to consent to the enrollment of her children into any other school than R has resulted in her children not attending school at all. Her conduct in this regard is unreasonable and should be manifestly seen as not in the best interest of her child. Similarly, justices, the respondents in the resettlement agreement, and if you'll see in the uh, set of facts, it is quite crisp, and that it says that the, the relocation to the city center is inter alia one of the things that we are committing to do. There are others. The list is not exhaustive. Similarly, the respondents have invested a lot of money to ensure that they can provide adequate housing in the city center and that these children have access to schools. The applicant's refusal to utilize that house, housing has left their children homeless and stranded and has resulted in the, these children missing instructional time at school. As was decided in the above case, this conduct should be viewed by this court as unreasonable and manifestly not in the best interest of the child. It is common cause, Justices, that the unemployment rate in the Eastern Cape is sitting at an all-time high of 40%, as was um, determined by the Eastern Cape Social Economic Consultative Council in the first quarter of 2023. The respondents, that is why they are willing to give the members of this community first preference when it comes to jobs at the mine, especially those members who are unskilled that can be trained in-house. What does this mean for the children of this community? It means that their parents will be able to provide for these basic, or will be in a position to be better able to provide for these basic um, rights such as health care and education because of the health care benefits that will come with these jobs such as medical aid. Justices, when it comes to the children's um, rights to basic education, shelter, nutrition and services, we submit that the location of the city center alone allows these children better access to these rights. Why? It is clear, uh, it is crisp that this area is in a remote area, or this land in question is in a remote area. These children probably have to travel long distances to access schools. We don't know if they have recreational facilities here, clinics, um, libraries, hospitals, and things like that. In closing, I'd like to leave this court and the applicants with these questions to consider. Have their parents maybe considered the advantages of the relocation to the city center in instances where maybe a child gets critically ill in the middle of the night and is in need of urgent medical care? How far is the hospital? What are the roads like when they need to get there? Justices, in conclusion, this case presents a profound clash between the imperatives of economic growth and the preservation of fundamental human rights. The Constitutional Court's deliberation The Constitutional Court's deliberation on this matter carries an immense significance as it holds the key in achieving a delicate equilibrium between these two competing interests. The facts, yes, reveal a narrative of a community that is deeply rooted, rooted in, in it, its in ancestral land, relying on it not just for substances but for cultural practices. But on the other hand, is this mining operation who is seeking to harness the economic potential of this land and in the process um, it is going to boost the struggling economy of this region and is going to aid in lowering the high unemployment rate. The court's decision will not only determine the fate of the applicants, but will set a precedent for balancing the economic development with human rights that will resonate well beyond this case. We have already said the admission of Save the Culture as amicus curate does not offer this court any greater opportunity for a comprehensive understanding of the intricate cultural, legal, and social Justices, in rendering its judgment, the Constitutional Court must navigate the intricate fabric of constitutional values and the potential benefits that this mining venture can bring to uplift this community and allow them to gain access to rights such as basic education, schooling, housing, and health care. This judgment has the potential to reaffirm the country's commitment to economic equality as envisioned in the Constitution. As the board pleases.
as the court pleases, if I may be of no further use, here are a praise um, on behalf of the respondents. Justices, the respondents pray for an order as to the following. Number one, an order dismissing the urgent and direct application or direct appeal application correction that this court finds that the removal and resettlement was indeed in line with section 25 of the constitution, that the national, provincial, and local governments have not failed to uphold their constitutional obligations, that the application of Save the Culture to be admitted as amicus be dismissed because it is of no use, and we ask for no order as to the costs. If I, be, if I may be of no further use to the bench, this is where we will end our session. Well, we, we don't usually use or abuse counsel, so you wouldn't normally say that. Oh. Just, that's all in your oh. That's all. Are you Cape Town, right? Yes, we are Cape As the court pleases your justices on the issue of consult, section five, subsection four of the section five, subsection four C of the MPRDA states that consent must be obtained obtained from the lawful occupiers. Uh, however, the respondents, the seven respondents, failed to get proper consultation since paragraph two point eleven of the fact states that there was no mandate. From, from, from the community. Uh, the ballot, uh, as the court pieces your justices, section 211 and 212 of the Constitution states that there has to be a recognition of the traditional, traditional or customary law. However, the respondents failed to approach, since it stated in the, in the facts that the, all the require, legislative requirements were met. However, they didn't bother to ask the, 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 the appellants about their traditional council obligations or the constitution and further took Mestankopodi's consultation. Mestankopodi unilaterally, unilaterally consented and the school for the blind, the school for the blind was always his interest and the community, the members of the traditional council outvoted Mestankopodi's interest, which violated schedule two subsection one of the traditional council, as stated in my previous argument. In terms of section 26, the housing codes, the interim protection, section 26 of the interim protection of informal land rights states that where relocation is unavoidable, it should be based on the principles of minimal disruptions to the affected persons and to relocating people to their, to their site as close as possible to the existing settlement. However, the respondents were, 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 had an agreement with Mr. Nkopodi to relocate the first applicant to the city center. How are they going to practice their culture? Since the right to culture in Section 31 was violated, the third and fourth respondents were the Inyangas, were practicing their traditional, traditional practice. How are they going to practice their culture if they were removed? if they were moved far from their Shiklenim Senga community. Furthermore, the section six of the interim protection states that the community participation around relocation is not only mandatory, but must be considered as a key success factor in an informal settlement project and one of, the, one of its greatest risks. Furthermore, Mr. Nkopodi is the only person who signed and notarized the relocation settlement without consulting, and the majority of the members were part of the negotiations. However, the respondents failed to go back and confirm that Mr. Nkopodi is the one who's only consulting because the, 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 the ACC obligation states that there has to be one traditional member, two or four members of the traditional council. As the court pleases your justices. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> oh, is your rebuttal finished? Nobody else is going to speak. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Yes, the court places your justices. So we will adjourn now for 10 minutes for us to deliberate. And then we will uh, give judgment. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I see most of you are familiar with technology, ne? so you're not like us born PC before computers. So I would request that um, you follow Unisa Law Clinic on all social media platforms, like our YouTube pages, uh, Facebook pages, X, formerly Twitter, just like and follow. Uh, let's get the, the, the viewership higher. So if you can kindly do that. And, uh, and post and retweet. Yes. Uh, whatever you, just follow. You'll see all the programs there.
Hey, did you feel the heat? It was hot, eh? Yo, 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 yo. Hi, 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 hi. Hey, it's still hot. Yo. I don't know you guys were cooking, man. You understood the assignment. No, you guys, you guys, you, I uh, know. I, I couldn't have done better myself. I'm really, really impressed. So, yes. So, in a moment, the, the judges will be coming back. Please, please sit down. Please settle down. Please find a chair. I think there are plenty of chairs. Um, yes, so that um, the judges can give us the judgment, what we've all been waiting for, as to who is the final winner. But anyway, there are no, winner, there are no losers here. You've all won. Coming this far, you've all won, believe me. And believe, it was tough to decide. After hearing those arguments, I, I, I don't even know who to rule in favor. So um, when the judges are ready, I'll just see one of them pop up there. And then we'll, in an orderly fashion, I'll say all rise, and then they'll come through uh, as per court protocol. And then when they sit down, we'll take a seat, and then we'll wait for them to give us a judgment. Can you check them? <clears throat> Young ones there at the back, was it interesting? Sure, sure. Yes. Okay, no, that's good. All rise. You may be seated. As another house rule, um, just to respect proper decorum, I'm gonna request humbly that please just your cell phones be off again, so that um, or be on silent, so that we don't interrupt the judgment. Um, and also that um, please don't press any of the mics so that um, it's only the judge's microphones that will be uh, pro projecting uh, in, 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 this, in this courtroom. So without further ado, um, up, it's over to the judges to give judgment. Um. Judgment. Introduction. The matter before us today relates to a piece of land in the Bohang region of the Eastern Cape which boasts voluminous reserves of natural resources. The land is desired by two groups of people, the Shingi Menenga community on the one hand and hereafter referred to as the community and the Iron Africa Mining Corporate hearing after referred to as IAMC, on the other. The community represented by the first to the seventh applicant, the applicants whose ancestors used, used to reside in the eastern region for over 200 years, were forced to relocate to the north of the region due to the remoteness of the location. When this occurred, it is unclear. For generations, they relied on the informal community by farming and selling vegetables, livestock, 
and the making and selling of pottery for their subsistence. As time went on and in pursuit of sustenance in the form of fertile soil to the farm, pastures for their livestock, as well as various water sources, they decided to return to the land of their origins east of the region. Unbeknown to them at the time of their return, the seventh respondent, IAMC, had obtained a mining permit from the Bukhang municipality to exploit the other mineral resources it desired. The richness of the land is not only limited to the agricultural potential, rather it proves to be plentiful in iron ore. Iron ore is a valuable commodity in South Africa as it is high demand in internationally. It contributes to the competitive mining economy which South Africa is part of and is responsible for 8% contribution of the gross domestic product, the GDP of the country. The court in the decision of Maledu had to say about the role of the mining industry in South Africa. Mining is one of the major contributors to the national economy, but there is constitutional imperative that should not be lost from sight, which imposes an obligation on Parliament to ensure that persons or communities, that persons or communities whose tenure of land is legally insecure as a result of past racially discriminatory laws or practices are entitled either to tenure, which is legally secure, or to comparable redress. Accordingly, this case implicates the right to engage in economic activity on the one hand and the right to security of tenure on the other. Undoubtedly, the interests of both sides of the aisle are quite significant, and as such, the tension between the need to engage in economic activity and the right to land are not, necessary, are not easily resolved. <coughs> it is this tension that this court is called upon to wrestle with. Amicus Curia. Before turning to the merits of this application, it is necessary to deal with an application for admission as Amicus Curia. As this matter was brought before the court, Save the Children, an unregistered NGO, approached the court in an application to be admitted as amicus, amicus curia. They submit that they possess intimate knowledge of the issues that have led to the conflict between the applicants and the respondents, as well as being in possession of evidence relating to the rights violations which occurred during the forced removals which will, be, which will be dealt with shortly. The application for leave to be admitted as amicus curiae is opposed by the respondents on the grounds that to do so would be a waste of the court's time and resources. The principles that govern whether a party should be admitted as an amicus curiae are well established in our law. An applicant for admission must, one, advance relevant, useful, and new contentions going beyond those of the litigants. Two, not adopt a partisan stance, which is more akin to being a litigant rather than a friend of the court, and advance submissions which will be aimed assisting the court with reaching a just outcome. Firstly, in the present matter, it is evident that save the children will not be placing before the court any argument or evidence which has not already been raised by the litigants. There is nothing in their application which suggests that they will be presenting any information which is new or useful to the court. Secondly, Save the Children has demonstrably chosen to approach the court in support of the applicants. They therefore cannot be considered to be unbiased friend of the court and, and, unbiased, friend of, and unbiased friend of the court. Their participation in the proceedings will only serve to influence the court to find in favour of the one party over the other. They are therefore unsuitable to act as a friend of the court. The dispute. IAMC 
leaders in the iron ore mining industry after conducting prospecting operations in the region of Bochang in Eastern, applied for and were awarded a permit to mine on the land. The facts before us show that the legislative and policy requirements for obtaining the prospecting rights and for granting the mining rights were all complied with. This, according to Section 5 in brackets 1 of the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act, uh, here and after referred to as the MPRDA, makes them a holder of a limited real right. A, a limited real right. The mining right grants to the holder a right of access to the land, even against the wishes of the landowner. The mining right holder is free to do everything necessary in the exercise of their right. By all accounts, there appears to be no contestation from the applicants about the validity of the mining rights that IAMC has obtained. But for a contractual dispute between IAMC and its e equipment provider, the mining operation would have started shortly after the permit was awarded by the municipality without any hindrance. Unfortunately for IAMC, its contractual dispute caused a nine-year delay in the commencement of the mining operations, which saw, which saw the community returning to their ancestral land in search of greener pastures. Therein lies the dispute. We are told that once the IAMC had dispensed with their contractual dispute against their equipment providers, they sought to begin mining operations. This was not possible, however, because at that point, the applicants had settled firmly onto the land. Some members of the community, such as the first and second applicants, are fourth-generation vegetable farmers who have been able to send their children to schools through the income they receive from farming. Another member of the community, the third applicant, is the Anyanga and Sangoma, who relies on the plethora of plants and natural minerals on the land, which are essential to the traditional medicine that he prescribes to his patients. It is thus become necessary for the IAMC to follow the prescripts of the MPRDA and commence with a consultative process with the community members. The IAMC consulted with the Council of the Traditional Healers representing the community, the African Community Council, ACC, here and after referred to, representing the entire community unless the context, un context dictates otherwise. During the negotiation and consultation process, there appears to have been some misrepresentations made by a certain Mr. Kopodi, who claimed to speak on behalf of the community when he, according to the ACC, he did so. Suffice it to say that the IAMC was left with an impression that they had received consent from the ACC for the community to relocate. However, when the time came, the community refused to relocate citing a deep connection to the land which goes beyond the economic benefits it possesses. It possesses. They recall the deep cultural, spiritual and traditional roots which also include a high regard for the sacred burial grounds of their ancestors. Consequently, the IAMC took it upon themselves to have the community members forcefully removed from the land. They saw fit to employ the eighth respondent, forceful removers, to forcefully remove the community members to the city centre, a decision which has left the community members stranded without adequate shelter, food and water. It is these facts that the matter appeared before the Tata High Court, which in turn found in favour of the respondents. The applicants thus seek audience with this court. Jurisdiction. The applicants have approached this court on an urgent basis, seeking direct access to appeal the decision of the court, I quote. 
They wish to bypass the Supreme Court of Appeal, the SCA, in their endeavour. As such, it becomes necessary to determine firstly whether this court is clothed with jurisdiction and secondly whether it would be appropriate for it to exercise said, said jurisdiction if apparent. The applicants argue that the forced removals were unconstitutional as they violate their right to dignity and amount to an unjustified deprivation of their property and land rights. On the face of it, seeing as constitutional issues have been raised by the applicant, it appears on the face of it, seeing as constitutional issues have been raised by the applicants, it appears that the matter would engage the court's constitutional jurisdiction. The constitutional court, as the highest court in the Republic, may decide on constitutional matter. However, while the court has the power to decide on any matter which raises a constitutional issue, it is not obliged to exercise the jurisdiction in every instance where it is called upon to do so, unless, of course, it is a matter on which it has exclusive jurisdiction. This is especially so when it is called to do so on the basis of direct access. The Constitutional Court may, in addition to uh, constitutional issues, also decide on any matter that raises an arguable point of law of general public importance which ought to be considered by the court. As already noted, the court can be clothed with jurisdiction, but the inquiry does not end there. What remains to be determined is whether it would in fact be in the interest of justice for it to hear an application of this nature on the basis of direct access. An application for direct access to this court is an extraordinary procedure that ought to be followed only in exceptional circumstances. In order for this court to grant direct access, persuasive and compelling reasons should be put before the court. Cheskelson P. We don't use P anymore, but at that date of the institution of the Constitutional Court, P stood for president, and Chaskelson was the president, outlined in the matter of Bruce versus Fleesex, Johannesburg CC, which had been referred to with approval in subsequent judgment, he held. This court could be called upon to deal with disputed facts on which evidence might be necessary to decide constitutional issues which are not decisive of, litig of litigation and which might prove to be purely academic, and to hear cases within the benefit of the views of the other courts having constitutional jurisdiction. This was a potent warning against allowing any and all constitutional matters to come directly to this court. It was a recognition that the prospects of success are not the only issue to be considered. Given this court's ruling, it is final. Given that this court's ruling is final with no possibility of appeal, it should hesitate to exercise the, that jurisdiction where it may not be prudent to do so. There are a number of issues that plague this application. The first in question, the first is a question about the status of the community as relates to their rights to the land. The second relates to the factual disputes relating to the status of the community on the land. The Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act, IPILRA, appears to be the relevant authority. Section 1 of the IPILRA sets out the definition of informal right to land. I'm not going to read it here. The judgment will be put up on the website for you and you'll be able to read it from there. The applicants in their heads have made the argument that they hold informal land rights in terms of, of 
IPILRA. They have not provided more in by way of evidence to support this claim. Whether or not the applicants do intend indeed hold formal, informal land rights is a factual question that would need to be adjudicated with relevant evidence placed before the court. A mere assertion of historical ties to the land does not suffice, especially considering that the community had relocated to the north of the region for an undetermined period of time. The preliminary determination is what would allow the court to decide how to solve the tension between the rights and the responsibilities of the permit holder on the one hand and those of the land holder, holder on the other. Melidu, for instance, speaks of this question of whether the existence of the mineral rights or mining rights in this instance necess necessarily extinguishes the rights of the landowner or any other occupier of the land in question. And to read what Peter Sir AJ held, I would, refer you again. I would refer you again to the website. I'm not going to read it out. The circumstances in this case also raised before the court a question of whether the ownership of the farm should be determined by it. It held, thus depending on the outcome of the process, the application under the Land Titles Adjustment Act, it is possible that the applicants may well turn out to be the legal owners of the farm. It would therefore be ill-advised of this court at this stage to make a definitive finding on the ownership of the farm. The same is true in this matter. This court simply does not have all the evidence before it to make a meaningful determination on the facts, and as such, it would be inappropriate to make a definitive pronouncement. Mr. Nkopadi, the more challenging factor, factual concern relates to Mr. Nkopadi. The IAMC, after dispensing with the contractual disputes with their equipment provider, sought to continue with the mining operations. Again, they followed the prescripts of the M MPRDA and consulted with the Council of the Traditional Leaders representing the community, the ACC. For all intents and purposes, the IAMC was under the impression that all discussions and negotiations were being held between them and the rightful representative of the community. Enter Mr. Nkopadi, a gentleman who, according to the ACC, negotiated on behalf of the ACC without the proper authority. Mr. Nkopadi, by the ACC's version, misrepresented the wishes of the ACC by consenting to the relocation of the community to the city centre, subject to certain conditions which will be discussed shortly. It is worth noting that all other meetings between the IAMC and the ACC were properly constituted, but for the last one, where the chief had taken ill and Mr. Nkopadi declared himself to be the voice and authority of the community. From the perspective of the IAMC, they would consider themselves to have done everything right and expected of them as per the requirements of the MPRDA, such as obtaining the mining rights and consulting with the community. From their perspective, Mr. Nkopadi, Nkopadi was duly authorised to speak on behalf of the ACC. And given that, during the negotiations, and given that, from their perspective, Mr. Nkopadi was duly authorised to speak on behalf of the ACC. And given that, during the negotiations, the ACC was fully constituted at all material times except the final meeting. The question is open to be determined whether it was reasonable for the IAMC to rely on Mr. Nkopadi's declaration that he was the voice and authority of the community. The result of this 
was that the IAMC sought to enforce the relocation agreement signed and notarized by Mr. Nkopadi to the dismay of ACC. The, the applicants claim that Mr. Nkopadi had no such authority. Therefore, the consent given to the IA, IAMC is unenforceable. Whether the ostensible misrepresentation of Mr. Nkopadi vitates vitates the consent with which the IAMC proceeded is an example of the non-constitutional question of law on which this court would benefit greatly from the reasoning and interpretation of the SCA. What is more, Mr. Nkopadi has not been joined to the proceedings and thus cannot provide the court with his version of the events particularly as relates to the allegations leveled against him that he acted in his own personal interest when he included as part of the conditions of the relocation agreement that the IAMC builds a school for the blind and that he be made director of the school. The court simply cannot know what the truth of the matter is. The role and authority of Mr. Nkopadi in this entire matter presents a significant factual dispute this court is ill-equipped to deal with. Application for direct access. On the question of direct access, the Constitutional Court, the issue that always raises a dilemma is whether the SCA would be in a position to deliver a competent determination on the issues raised. The SCA, as the highest court of appeal, on non-constitutional matters still holds the capacity to pronounce on constitutional matters as long as they do not fall under the exclusive jurisdiction of this court. Should it be necessary for this court to hear the matter at some stage, it would benefit greatly from the reasoning of the SCA. Although the alleged constitutional violations are serious, the SCA is well Although the alleged constitutional violations are serious, the SCA is well suited to make a competent verdict which would protect the rights of both parties which still, while still leaving an option of appeal should the need arise. This also means, sorry, having considered these two issues, it is our view that it would not be appropriate for this court to exercise jurisdiction in this matter. This also means, therefore, that it would be premature for this court to pronounce on the issue relating to the forceful removals and the effect that that has had on the community. It is thus not in the interests of justice to grant direct access to this court costs relating to the amicus curiae. Notwithstanding the fact that the amicus curiae has not made out a convincing case in this matter, the buyer watch principle will be applied. I therefore, we therefore make the following order. In the circumstances, the following order is granted. The application for leave to appeal directly to the Constitutional Court is dismissed. The application to admit Save the Children as amicus curiae is dismissed. The applicants are ordered to pay the costs of the seventh and eighth respondents. The, rem the remaining respondents agree to abide the decision of the court, jointly and severally, the one paying the other to be absolved, which costs shall include the cost of two counsel. No cost order will be made in respect of the amicus curiae. I agree. I agree. I agree. By the court. Yo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Um, 
Okay. So the judgment will be on the website. Yes, the judgment will be posted on um, the Unisa Law Clinic website. Um, you are all welcome to uh, go to the website and read it. As you saw, it was actually a very thorough, very well written judgment. Um, all I can say is yo. But <laughs> anyway, um, so as to not waste time, um, I'd like to say um, congratulations to the winning team. I think they know who they are. I think we, they deserve a round of applause. You can stand up so that everyone can see you. Well done, well done. And uh, also, well done to, to your mentor and uh, Prof. Dube, you did a stellar job. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, the applicants, you are not losers. You did great as well. Your arguments are great. Well done to you too. Yes, we come to almost the end of the program. Um, we've just decided to change the program up, up a bit so that we're going to do the prize giving and then we head off uh, to lunch. So then the program will be over. So what is next now is basically the prize giving. Um, I'm sure you're all excited because there are categories that no one knows as to who the winner is, especially the best oralists and the best heads of arguments, who those go to. So uh, I, like you, wait in pa with bated breath and in serious anticipation as to who the winners are. So um, we'll go to the first, um, I will say, in award show they say nominations. So this is not a particular nomination, but um, these are these are the legal Oscars. <laughs> so yes, um, I'd like to call to the forefront, uh, Mr. Mputi and Ms. Zororo, who participated in this competition last year, and they were on the winning team, if I'm not mistaken, to hand out um, the medals the bronze medals to all the participants from all the regions when the moot court commenced, um, when everyone arrived on Monday and the moot court commenced on Tuesday. This is a sign of gratitude and a sign to say thank you to all who participated. Your efforts did not go unnoticed and so therefore you do deserve um, an appreciation gift. So. Um, this will go to all the regions, so I will call um, per region. Um, we will start by um, the, you will correct me if I miss a region, because I, I, know, I know I'm most susceptible to do so. I'm only human. So we'll start with Johannesburg. Then move to Ekuruleni.
Woo. I jumped the gun. My apologies. Um, I accept duties. I acted like the person who represented, who said you're coming to the right people. I represent the voice of the people. <laughs> yes. And um, for that, um, my, my actions are not to completely void, but... Um, <laughs> No, no, it's, it's not a train smash. I've just accepted someone's duties. So, Ms. Mahua, please come to the podium. So, let me not uh, completely accept all your duties. <laughs> she was supposed to do the announcement. Hold on. Bonani, greetings. Um, I am Tembisile Mahua, a candidate attorney right here at the UNISA Law Clinic. Um, the program director had already started, <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm not sure program director, but um, I know that it would be a big, big, big mistake for me to come to the podium and not acknowledge um, uh, everyone that is here present with us today and observe protocol. Um, I know that uh, Minister Nkosazana Damini Zuma is very specific about observing protocol, um, and I would first like to do that. Um, I would like to uh, greet the Vice Chancellor of UNISA in her absentia. I would like to greet the Dean of Students in um, the absentia, the management team. Um, I would like to greet the College of Law. Um, we are have in our presence Prof. Um, Budeli uh, Nemakonde, and I would also like to recognize the director of the School of Law, uh, Prof. Dube. I would like to acknowledge, I believe in his absentia, the head of the law clinic, Advocate Rahudi Murota, who is my boss, I proudly say that. And um, I would like to welcome, or rather to acknowledge um, our esteemed panel of judges. Um, we are very, very blessed to have you with us. Um, I would like to then acknowledge all Mood Court participants and program director, uh, Advocate Ngavinde, and everyone here, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, as I've said, I'm Tembisile Mahua. So we'll just continue from the um, uh, program director. However, maybe to speed the processes up, perhaps all the regions that have not been called out can come and have a line right here so that we can continue with the prize giving ceremony. So if you were part of the moot court competition this, uh, or pa this past year, please come and collect your um, acknowledgement. All team, please clap. Yeah. Hmm? I don't have the regions. I don't have the regions. That's why I don't. Do you have the regions? Okay. Um, thank you. So we will go to the Pretoria region. Please just stand here so that we can be quick. Um, the Pretoria region. Congratulations, everyone. They've done excellently well. We would like to call on the Durban, Durban region. It's very encouraging to see all regions uh, represented here today. It shows inclusion. It shows how powerful UNISA Law Clinic is. Thank you very much. And we have Middleburg. Middleburg, please come to the front. The UNISA Law Clinic opened up a Middleburg region um, office two years ago. So if you are in Middleburg and watching online, know that this is an opportunity for you to come through and join us. And we'd like to celebrate Pulukwane. The 
Inisa Law Clinic also has an office in Pulukwane. Be sure to check us out there. And we call out the Rustenburg region. The court has ruled in your favor, region of Cape Town. Well done. Thank you to our previous winners. It would be amiss to not mention that they went to Ghana last year. They represented UNISA. They represented UNISA in Ghana in the Mood Court competition. So you see, it doesn't end here. It does not end here. Team at the back. Let's hope to see you here in, in three, four years' time, right? Yes. Okay. Um, we'd like to call upon the executive um, acting dean, Prof. Budeli. You know, Prof. Budeli, I would like to um, share with you as you come on stage that uh, as a candidate in the um, UNISA Law Clinic, I have for um, the past year won 100% of, of the cases in my client's favor. So the work that we do here at the Law Clinic, I uh, know it's Della. It's Della. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we would like to call on the runner-ups. However, I do not see the awards for the runner-ups. Perhaps the team can um, come through and Arrange the, the, the awards team. The medals team for the run ups. I will just use this opportunity. I'm not sure, uh, you know, with our esteemed judge uh, panel, uh, you know, I'm a bit embarrassed to share this. Uh, perhaps Advocate Kabinda is coming with something. Let's wait a bit. Okay. 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 Um, thank you so much, Prof. Budeli. We'd like to congratulate all of the um, all of the contestants that were here with us today. We do not have currently the bronze medal, so we will just congratulate you. Um, you know, runner-ups. The uh, marketing team has done a stellar job in telling us those that were not even here who the runner-ups are. So thank you very much. Please let us clap hands for all our runner-ups. So we would like to call all teams that are runner-ups. The runner-up teams. Oh, the Rustenburg team. Uh, perhaps you can shake the hand of the acting executive dean, Prof. Budeli. Please come through. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Budeli. We will then move swiftly to um, the awards now. So we are going to speak about the awards. We're going to speak about the best 
oralists. Um, these are people that during the course um, have of course presented their case with extreme precision. Um, and we would like to have the announcement, so I'd like to call upon um, Judge Potterhill, Potterhill, my apologies, to please come um, to the podium. Oh, Judge Basil, sorry. When the judge calls you, you come. <laughs> um, congratulations, the panel as a whole. Um, it was Ad Idem decided that you were the best orator. So congratulations. <laughs> We can't wait to see you in a court because clearly that is what you're going to have to do, is you're going to have to speak in a court because you definitely... Oh, thank goodness. At least I can give you something. something. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, Advocate Nikobindi is scared of you now. <laughs> Very much so. Okay, is what's her name? Masoko. Masoko. And the runner up is Miss Masoko. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. And the same counts for you. Don't waste your talents, use them in court. Okay. And, and, can I just, just say that it was a difficult decision because all of you did well, and it's in a moot court, unfortunately, somebody always gets the short stick. They don't normally get the facts that necessarily makes it easy to ma make out a good argument. So um, you can all three also go away feeling very good. And now you can say you are out an award-winning lawyer um, while you are still in um, or currently doing your LLB. So congratulations to you, best oralist. <laughs> and now the time that we have been waiting for, um, we are going to hear from our esteemed judge, Professor Gandolfinger, on two very, very, very exciting um, awards. And we're going to hear the best heads and the winning team. Um, we have seen, remember, that just because the court ruled in your favor does not mean you are the winning team. Mm. Right? Mm. Okay, um, so we are going to call upon Professor Gandalfinger, and Professor has been with us and being with Mood Court for a very long time, and we continue to draw from the well of wisdom, uh, Professor Gandalfinger, that you pref uh, continue to give to us. So I will waste no time in calling upon our esteemed judge, Professor Gandalfinger. Let's clap for it. And the winner of Best Heads is Cape Town.
And the winning team goes to... Cape Town. Congratulations, Professor Dube. <laughs> Let's call upon our other judges to join in taking the picture with the winning team. program director said we are all winners here we are all winners we have gained extreme knowledge from this competition thank you very much as they take their seats let's give them one last round of applause Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the opportunity. Um, thank you, Program Director. You know, Program Director was interviewing President, His Excellency President Bakey, just this Thursday, and I, I represented the legal uh, fraternity. I told him that um, I will change um, the narrative and that attorneys and all uh, legal personnel can be short. Uh, Program Director, I think I've done that as well again today. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Mahua. Um, that was an exciting awards giving ceremony. Um, but it is not only the participants that get awards. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it is also our esteemed judges who we also need to thank. And I, I think I've run out of uh, data bundles for speaking today. So um, I will hand over to my learned colleague, Ms. Shaida Muhammad, to come and give tokens of appreciation to our esteemed judges. Ms. Muhammad, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. As William Arthur Ward, a motivational writer once said, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. I therefore feel honored to propose the vote of thanks on this special occasion. On behalf of the head of the UNISA Law Clinic, Advocate Morota, we have an extra special thanks to give to our honorable judges over the previous days and today. Each of these judges are an example of leadership and integrity that our future presiding officers can look up to for guidance. You have inspired us with your presence here today and we will continue to look towards you for further inspiration and guidance. Judge Basson, your presence here today is truly appreciated. We thank you for taking the time to be with us today, and you have made this competition memorable. <laughs> Judge Potterell, 
You are an inspiration, you are appreciated, and we are privileged to have you in our midst. Thank you so much, Judge Potterall, for being here today. <laughs> Professor Gandalfinger, sir, your continuous support, your mentorship, guidance, and dedication towards the moot court, year in and year out, has not gone unnoticed. We see you, we appreciate you, and we thank you. UNISA Moot Court is not complete without you. If time is money, then today, judges, you have given us millions. May I also take this opportunity to express sincere thanks to the College of Law Deanery for being a rock of support, for standing by us all the way through. Professor Kole, for your message of support this morning. Professor Dube, for your constant commitment towards the moot court. Professor Budeli, you made an amazing judge, and we thank you for your contributions today. My colleague, Ms. Nyabaza, will now assist me to hand over the tokens of appreciation to our judges. <laughs> judges, may I please ask that you come forward and um, receive a token of appreciation and a photograph. There you have them, ladies and gentlemen, our honorable judges. Let's give them a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, I now extend thanks to our trainers. It is you who made our participants who they are today. Your grooming, your skills empowerment, your time, your efforts, your dedication is very much appreciated. No amount of acknowledgement and appreciation will equate for the sacrifices you have made for our students, and for that, we say thank you. An event of this dimension cannot happen overnight. The wheels start rolling months in advance. I would like to give gratitude and thanks to all of the Moot Court Committee members and the members of ULSA, as well as the really, truly amazing staff of the UNISA Law Clinic for your tremendous work in putting this event together. The people who made 2023 Moot Court competition possible. Ms. Nyabaza, Ms. Mompati, the project coordinators, and all those behind the scenes, you have done an amazing job. Thank you. <laughs> to the ushers, timekeepers, and court orderlies, you have played an important role in the competition, and we thank you. We would also like to recognize and thank most sincerely each of you in the hall today, our special guests from Botebo Tsebo Secondary School, and as well as our online viewers, this event would not be possible without your support. To those who travel from far and wide to support our participants, thank you for being here. A big thank you to our MC, Advocate and Kabinde, for keeping us going today. And a final congratulations and thank you on my behalf and on behalf of the head of the law clinic and the College of Law to all of the participants for participating, for not giving up, for putting your best foot forward, and for making Mood Court 2023 possible. Your presentations reflected your days of hard work, and your presentations by each one of you were excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, let's make some noise for the real VIPs of today's event, the participants. Give yourselves a round of applause.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That marks the end of our vote of thanks, and I will now hand over to our MC for the final announcements. Thank you so much. In the words of an urban poet, Snoop Dogg, <laughs> I would like to thank me. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for your cooperation, your indulgence with us, and and for for your passion and and understanding and I don't know just overall love for the law when the presentations were made. It's all inspiring. It shows that indeed the judiciary of our country is in good hands with all of you sitting in here, especially the young ones up there as well. Um, I, I love what I'm seeing. Thank you to the judges. Thank you so much. Your contribution, your sacrifice to be here has not gone unrecognized. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts as the law clinic, we thank you. Um, the organizing team, um, all of you, the staff, um, the ushers, as Mishaira Muhammad has said, Everyone present in this room, we thank you. Uh, even the trainers, we thank you so much. Um, everyone online, from Advocate Morota, the head of the law clinic, we thank all of you for your presence. And this concludes today's sitting of the 2023 Moot Court competition. And now, um, as in, my job is not done, because I have a few more announcements. Um, firstly, is to say that judges, um, you can make your way back to the holding area where... Uh, it's a matter of interpretation. <laughs> the VIP room. You do know that when they do transport them, we call them VIPs because traffic will make way for them anyway. So, yes, the VIP room, um, the holding VIP room. Yes. Um, and then I would request that after the judges have left, um, you remain um, as there are a few more announcements for everyone else in this room except the judges. All rise. All right, now that the adults are gone, we can play. I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, a few more announcements. Um, with regards to the participants' awards, a few of the awards made their way back to uh, the, the hall just in time before we, we leave. So all the participants, and I mean from all the regions, um, you can then, uh, you are entitled to a gift. Uh, I don't know why I don't get gifts, but anyway. <laughs> it's a selfless and thankless job. Um, so we are going to call the, um, the participants with according to the regions. The regions, yes. According to the regions where you, on top of the medal that you received, you receive another award uh, or another present. I think uh, the UNISA Law Clinic is like the Oprah show. You get an award, you get an award. Everybody gets an award. <laughs> yes. So, um, 
We will start with the city of gold, Johannesburg. Give them a round of applause, guys. Well done, Joburg. We will then move on to Ekurulene. I, I don't know what Ekurulene is famous for. Next up, Banabawumma Pologwane. Banabawumma, the man from Sashur. <laughs> Then we will move to people from my hometown. I lived there, primary and high school. Middleburg. The city where there is no winter, Deben. I must say, you are also the loveliest city amongst all here. You are, if there's an award for win, the most beautiful city here, you win. A round of applause for Durban, guys. Thank you so much. And um, the capital city, home ground advantage, Pretoria. And um, the runners up, the city of platinum, Rustenberg. <laughs> you know how I knew you guys were from Rustenberg? You guys know that mining legislation like from the back of your hands. <laughs> I just knew it. <laughs> Hey, they would quote that. Mogulukwan, Mogulukwan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for bearing with us. And luckily, we finished the whole program with 10 minutes late for lunch. So I would say we all deserve a pat on the back because we are like two hours ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so with regards to, to lunch, you know, as they say at, uh, at funerals, so yes, uh, in an orderly fashion, I'd like to thank, to ask and request our special guests. I think I'm getting an instruction. Right. 
Yes, so uh, as I was saying, lifting Karai. So when you come out from the door there to the right, there is a serving station there. And because we are many, we are plenty, don't worry, there's enough for all of us. I would request that we live in an orderly fashion in the following manner. The participants, that means all the participants, that means um, from Cape Town to Middleback, Polokwane to Deben, every, all the participants, uh, you exit first and, and your trainers. <laughs> 